Happy Mushroom Mondays, everybody. Welcome back to yet another Trek, the Mushroom Tensei Java Reincarnation novel series. We're on volume 21, chapter 6 and 7. Yes, as everybody has requested, we will be doing a, I, I, I keep fighting myself from saying live, a first time read record premiere of chapter 6 and chapter 7. A bunch of people requested those specific chapters to be read live record first time and also a lot of people saying they wanted together so i have some people saying you should do two chapters do five and six i've right, done five <laughs> it's like everybody wants to do this this that kind of just got the mods to decide for me i i if you guys have the request like that i'm going to keep it to the mods they're going to make that final decision i don't want to do like actual like first time reads for everything just because one of the kind of things that we've kind of developed with the Mishiko Mondays is you know having the voices for the characters and having it flow a little better being able to condense it quite a bit I don't want to just read the entire book and yeah a lot of those things kind of get messed up with the first time reads because I don't know who's talking until it says said blah blah so I can't do the voices and whatnot so yeah keep that in mind as I'm reading I'm just going to really kind of just run through the quotes rather than being able to know who's actually talking so I can't do their voices all those kind of things. There's there's pros and cons to both ways, but either way, a lot of people want me to do first time in here. I know there's an aspect of the reaction to something crazy happening, I'm assuming, or some big revelation. Again, I have my predictions it's going to be around <laughs> Zenith because I know how much people know that I am, I have a soft spot for Zenith just because of my own personal experiences. But we'll see. It could just be some mind-blowing revelation as obviously there's going to be a reveal of something coming up here. So we'll see. But as per usual, greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate everybody that dropped by for the premiere. Hey, chat. Hope you guys are doing well. Hope you guys do well during the chat and don't spoil things. We did well, not during five, but as of the recording of this, we just went through three and four. So you guys did well. So we'll see if you guys can keep that up. So anyways, with all that said, greatly, greatly appreciate the support, kind words, everything. It means a great deal to me. And yes, greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate everybody that supports channel monetarily through Patreon, tips, links, super thanks, memberships all the good stuff. Once again, have to do a voiceover for who supported the channel last week. So HQ with a super, Joshua with a super, Inferno Torch with a super, and a massive super from Gearless and Biako. Thank you guys so much. It means a great deal to me. But with that said, let's get into it. Chapter six, for the good of my daughter and my family. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. From the day she was born, Claire Latria was vain and hard-headed. As a child, she never admitted to any wrongdoing, and she only apologized when it was dragged out of her. Her own mother, Ruiz's great-grandmother, Merid Meridy? I think it's Meridy. Meridy Latria told her, conduct yourself correctly. But this advice was gravely misguided. Claire, unwilling and unable to see her own faults, believed she had none, that her stubbornness was justified. But mistakes make us human. Dang. It, it's kind of one of those moments where, like, you, you act like the mother acts like they've never done wrong and they're trying to guide their, their child. And it's like, yeah, you used to be like that when you were younger. Stop. Claire took her mother's advice, however and it made her into a harsh girl. Not correct, just harsh. To herself, most of all. She started her education and made mistakes, because that's what an education is in some ways. Rather than accept that, her standards for herself only increased in their rigidity and cruelty. And if she had applied those torturous standards only to herself, you know, fine. But that's not what happened. Nobody could meet her expecting specifications, and she made sure that they suffered for it. All kind of plays out there. Without tempering her stubbornness and vanity, her mother's advice had ruined her. She had these twisted virtues. She was tough, and so she pushed through every adversity. She was vain, and so made sure nobody ever knew when she was hurting. And she expected that from everyone around her. She just couldn't hear that she was wrong. Nobody liked her. Interesting. Interesting. So, again, it really is kind of painting this picture that she's not somebody who has, like, a front-facing uh, strength. And then, like, behind closed doors, she's different. This is her always. The only side of her hurting is internal. Like, that's the only place you're ever going to see that, that fragility. You're, that's the only place you're going to see any sort of pain or suffering that she wants to express. It's never shown. Even behind closed doors, it's never shown. I mean, she could, and it's nobody, she just knows that nobody sees it. But, like, this idea that even with her most comforting people, even the most trusted people, she's not going to have that, that weakness shown. She always has that strength. I can't help but think when I'm reading this, it sounds very familiar to Aisha. Now, I, I always had the, man, that can't that, that can't be. But the way that Aisha was raised was by her mother, Lilia, and how she was drilling into her head to do all these tasks and do all these things and do it perfectly. It never indicated that Lilia was like super strict like Claire was. So don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that she 
create the same concept here, but it feels similar because what Aisha is going through right now is that she can't accept other people being faulty, other people having mistakes and whatnot. She can't accept that. So I almost feel like a parallel between Aisha <laughs> and Claire right now, which is kind of scary. Again, it seems like that trigger point is quite different, but they both have that same ex expectation that you can't fault. Now, I, I, there was a side of me that almost thought that maybe possibly that was something that Claire herself impressioned upon Aisha, but I don't necessarily think that is. But I will say that we never really seen a expectation of no faults back when Rius ran into Aisha and, and Sharon, and that would be the point, that, that would be pre-Claire. So it is interesting, but again, it, this is not something that's really kind of popped up until here recently with the whole, ask, it was really li uh, Linnea. Linnea was the first point in which we seen that. Now, granted, yes, she was pretty critical of Norn and Norn's mistakes, so I can see it there as well, but very interesting. To others, it looked like she succeeded effortlessly, only to turn around and berate anybody who struggled with the same mistakes again. <laughs> it's so Aisha. I hate how much they're paralleling Aisha right now. And she never apologized for anything. She was cold. And now Aisha apologizes when she is wrong. She barely is ever wrong. She was cold, pampered, and heartless. Some people saw through to the real Claire, of course. They recognized how hard she worked when no one was watching. But because she couldn't be vulnerable, recognition was all they could offer her. That is true. Like, the idea that somebody is always trying to be perfect, striving to be perfect, never have flaws, and always succeeding. And yes, I, I can see a lot of people, a lot of people not seeing that, assuming the worst. But then some people acknowledging, okay, no, it's not just a front-facing thing. This is something where she's constantly working hard. That's kind of like what I was talking about before with that 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 one boss that I had and how everybody would kind of be, you know, thinking they're just like basically living on a silver spoon their entire life and how they, they, they get paid so much and they have it so well made. And it's like, you guys don't see behind the door when that's closed. That dude's typing away. He's constantly moving stuff around. He's constantly on the phone. This dude is pushing it. Claire, these well-mannered individuals would say, I see the real you, but nobody else will. Still, she refused to change. She saw nothing wrong with her mother's words, nor with her own philosophy. This was working for her. Why change? And again, I was going to mention earlier, but yeah, I can see that aspect of constantly having that front-facing self, of never wanting to show that vulnerability and always being strong. What else can somebody do for you besides recognize that? They can't offer anything else. They can't support you, essentially. If you're not showing any flaws, if you're not showing a need for any sort of help or some sort of acknowledgement for the pain that you're going through, they can't be there to even support you with that. To just lend a listening ear. I can't offer a lot of people, you know, certain things. Like people contact me, you know, through DMs or whatever, and they're like, you know, I like your content. And then after a while we're talking, we find out they're they're going through a trouble. Like they relate with me with the whole thing with Zenith, say for example. Man, yeah, I got somebody going through that right now. Like it's really rough. I can't say that I can fix their problem. I can't say that I'm going to... To, to, to give them the world and everything's fixed. But I can at least lend an ear. That's enough. Like, just that simple task, I, I feel, was for me, and it seems like it's for the, a lot of these people, that's all they wanted. Hear me out. Somebody that can relate to me and just listen to me say something. They drop a massive paragraph, and I look through it, and I, I, I tell them my, my thoughts on some things, and like, that's enough. I thank you so much. I just needed somebody to hear me. Claire doesn't have that. She doesn't even want to open that door to at least have somebody listen to where she's hurting. Because if she can at least have somebody listen to how she's hurting, it could mean the world to her. And I think because of that lack of showing that pain, I think it does dehumanize a person. Being able to talk about your problems could essentially, I think, dehumanize you in a way. By the time she came of age, man, we're that far back. <laughs> I thought we were already getting pretty close to adulthood. She's not even 15 yet. Everyone was sick of her and no one would have her as a bride. The topic is, now we're going to start paralleling Edis. The topic of marriage was broached on a number of occasions. She was the eldest daughter of the house lottery after all. But when interested noblemen met her and saw her hardness and her stubbornness for themselves, they ran screaming. <laughs> like, hell no, I ain't going to deal with that. It's already kind of painting this massive picture for uh, Carlisle. That's for dang sure. If I can't find a husband then I shall simply become a nun, declared Claire when she was 18 years old. Man, she's, yeah, for three years, she ain't working it. <laughs> she was a lady of the house Latria. Becoming a nun was preferable to bringing shame on the family name by becoming an old maid. In Millis, it was a common path for young women in those days. Yeah, I could see that. In Millis, I could see that being a really thing. It, it would be seen, it's one of those things of like, 
if she can't find a husband, it will look bad upon House Latria. Oh, there's the the manless woman. She never got married. She was never good. Like it shows a negative effect to House Latria about how she could never find herself a man. The only path to really kind of showing something positive from it is becoming a nun. Because then that shows devotion to the faith. Like, oh, it's not that she couldn't find a man. It's not that she's going to just be alone her entire life. How sad existence. It's, man, look at her dedication. She became a nun for the faith. She's devoting her body, mind, soul to the faith. Claire Latria was harsh to herself and harsh to everyone around her. And that was basically all there was to her. Again, like Orsid said, <laughs> she ain't nothing special about her. There lived a boy named Carlisle Granz. Carlisle was fresh addition to the Temple Knights who served as a member of the Sword Company under the direct command of Rockin Latria, Claire's father. One day, Claire's father came home drunk. Rockin himself was a rigid man. That was the only side Claire or her mother saw of him. It was therefore highly out of character for him to come home drunk. Out of character in a sense that it was incongruous, but not in a sense that it was rare. Claire's mother knew the routine whenever he came staggering in. She removed his armor, gave him water to drink, and helped him into bed. So the servants would only think him tired. She never told them off for it. She knew how stressful the job of a temple knight could be. He was unlucky on one particular occasion, however. Claire's mother had gone out to visit the parents and was away from the house. So for the first time, Claire faced her father's failings without her mother being there to protect him. She admonished him bitterly. <laughs> Interesting. I mean, even the fact that, like, it kind of implies the idea that every time he comes there, the mother would kind of rush in there, fix the situation so that nobody would see it. But this is the one time that Claire actually seen it, so she goes after him. I can't believe you would do this. Aren't you the head of the Latria family? Was everything you taught me empty words to you? Her father was drunk, but he was nevertheless shamed into silence that he had allowed his daughter to see him like this. Instead, the young knight who had accompanied him home spoke. This was Carlisle. I can explain why the captain was drinking today, he said. One of our knights was killed on duty. It was no one's fault, but we went out to drink to their memory. The captain only drank too much because he felt remorse for the death of his subordinate. I won't stand here and see him insulted that way, even by his own daughter. Claire didn't reply. She didn't know what to say. Her anger had disappeared. Is he lying? Because it seems like he does this on a regular basis. I mean, it doesn't imply it's always all the time, but it seems like whenever it does happen, the mother's there to kind of hide it. But still, it's like, is it true? But I can see that. I mean, it, being the captain of the knights, I can see that being a regular thing. That if, if it does hurt you to see your own men die... And yes, as a commander, constantly seeing that you're at fault, yeah, you're gonna, you're probably gonna throw back the drinks and rather than mourn the death, maybe possibly celebrate their good works. She took care of her father in silence. She gave him water and allowed him to lean on her shoulder as he tried to apologize to her. She couldn't support him alone, however, so Carlisle ended up helping her to walk her father back to his room, change him out of his armor, and put him to bed. Through the whole process, Claire didn't utter a single word. She knew that she was in the wrong, but she couldn't bring herself to apologize to her father, nor to Carlisle. She was too stubborn for that, but Carlisle understood. He saw beneath her sullen expression. She recognized her mistake. Now, this is interesting, yeah. Somebody that is, like, very stern. Everybody seems to not like her. She never makes mistakes, never expresses herself. And finally having somebody, I guess, shoot back? It doesn't really imply that anybody's really pushing back to her. So is it a fact that finally somebody spoke back to her and very quickly she realized that she was and wrong like there was no arguing what Carlisle said that that's the thing that kind of made her shut up as he left he said you're kinder than you think you are at that time Claire had no idea what he meant <laughs> wait a good somebody thinks I'm kind <laughs> what is this what is this kind word all she knew is that this boy perhaps a year or two younger than herself had recognized something inside of her after that Carlisle began receiving frequent invitations to Latria estate and soon after, he and Claire were married. Aww. Aww. Somebody will take her. It's like a total Rudeus Edis moment right here. Finally, somebody is able to push back on this beast. And finally, let's get him married. See, I, I kind of wonder who, who was inviting him. Was it was, was it the Latria estate itself, like the father and mother? Or was it or was it the uh, or was it Claire herself? Claire and Carlisle had five children together. One boy and four girls. Claire raised the girls as severely as her own mother had raised her. See, that's the sucky part. It just passes on. It just passes on. Like, this is what my mother did. This is how I, that's how I, I see you're supposed to do it. Like, this is where my training came from what my mother did. So I'm going to do the same thing. But it's odd because it doesn't really, 
It does indicate the mother was very stern with her, but it feels like it kind of implies that she took too much out of it. Like she took it to the extremes. So she's going to pass down even a more strict regimen, I guess. Their eldest son joined the Temple Knights. Their eldest daughter married a Marcus. They were a perfect gentleman and lady, exactly as Claire had desired. She would have proudly presented them anywhere in Millis. Claire had the highest hopes for their second daughter, who was born a little later. This daughter was far more accomplished than the first two children. Everyone who met her was struck by her beauty and her integrity. She was Claire's finest work, her pride and joy, Zenith Latria. Claire's pride and joy. The problem there is the obvious conclusion here is as much as I want it to be an aspect of a mother just loving this daughter, her pride, that stands out. Joy from what? Joy from how successful she is? Or joy in I love my daughter? It sounds like it is business. Pride and joy. I don't know. We'll see. But Zenith left. She dashed all Claire's hopes, running away to become an adventurer, and then silence. That was quick. I was hoping it would get into more details, and it's like, and she left. <laughs> okay, we're not going to get into that whole situation there. Claire was apoplectic with rage. She cursed Zenith in front of her other children, calling her an idiot child who had made the stupidest choice imaginable, and warned them to refrain from emulating their sister in any way. It was the first time she ever let her feelings show so openly. The daughter she pinned her highest hopes upon had chosen the grubbiest life she could imagine. I could see that being a slip up in a heat of the moment kind of thing. No matter how much she tries to keep her emotions bottled up, that's like the breaking point. Everything that I had hopes for her, everything was planned. She was going to be the perfect one. It was going to be great. She was going to be a Latria that everybody would talk about for ages. And then she went off to be an adventurer? What the hell? In all of her life, that was a shock that hit Claire the hardest. The fate of their third daughter, Sala, similarly diverted from Claire's wishes. Sala married a baron, but he became embroiled in a power struggle, which he had lost. Sala was killed in the aftermath. I know where that one's going. I failed. I couldn't keep her from going in a bad path, and it got her killed. Mills' healing magic was highly advanced, and so such deaths were rare. Her death was one of those rare flukes. The family put the reputation of the House Latria on the line to ensure Sala's killer met a poetic end. Claire mourned her daughter. She mourned as any mother would have. Right here, it really is kind of cementing the idea that she is mourning as any other mother would. And what would any other mother would, would be at the sake of losing a daughter, not losing a chess piece, basically. We're making sure that Claire sees her daughters as daughters and humans and not as chess pieces. And while she mourned, her fourth daughter, Therese, chose a life Claire wouldn't have chosen for her. She joined the Temple Knights. She's like, damn it, it all started with, it all started with Zenith. All these kids going off and doing these stupid things. Claire cursed her fourth daughter as she had her second. You little fool. Do you really think you have what it takes to be a knight? If only you had listened to me and learned to be a proper lady, I would have found you a good husband. You could have been happy. See, Therese? She could have gotten you a husband, but you ran off and became a knight. You 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 start, you know, hanging out with them men in their, their suits of armors and their swords. Therese retorted, did dying in a power struggle make my sister happy? Damn. Didn't she join that against her wishes? The fate of the third daughter, Sala, similarly diverted from Claire's wishes. Well, I guess the idea here is that it's Therese saying... My sister went off and married somebody and got killed, even though it wasn't what Claire wanted. But she got married off to a husband and got involved in a power struggle and died. And now you want me to go off and get married to a man and be a proper lady just like she was, and I'll end up dead too. Interesting. It had turned into a terrible fight. Claire turned Therese out, telling her, you will never set foot in this house again. Never for a moment did she think that she had done anything wrong. Zenith and Therese had both left, but someday they would crawl back for forgiveness. She earnestly believed that. Ten years passed, no word came from Zenith, but Therese did well in the Temple Knights and was promoted to captain of the Blessed Child's personal guard. Answer for that, I had a theory that she was captain of the Blessed Child's guard because of the family name. Now, that could still be a thing, but it wasn't Claire's doing. Like, Claire didn't push this. And I even had a theory that the reason why she got back to there after the whole assassination thing and her getting shipped off was again because Claire put a word in for her. But it seems like, at least, again, it could still be the name, but at least the House Latria didn't have an involvement. Claire thought the Knights only handed the position to Therese because the Blessed Child was also female. Now, I did have that 
I mean, that was an obvious thing that was in back of my mind as well. Um, the idea of having somebody always at her side that would be female, but everybody else was male. So yeah, it does technically give the ability for her to be in, you know, in privacy when she's changing, but it, they could possibly not mind that the men are at her side during that time. It doesn't indicate that way just because of how like upset they were at the idea of like, you know, Rudy is touching her or whatever. It does kind of give that feeling that they've never kind of gotten that close to her, but still it does, it does make sense. She wasn't wrong. Therese was an excellent administrator and a commander, but no more than an average knight. Even so, all the parties that Claire accompanied her husband to, she heard people saying, the Latrias are really something. Everywhere you look, they're moving up in the world. Claire tore into others, but she was equally hard on herself. When she did realize that she had made a mistake, she would never apologize, but she was capable of changing her mind. Now that the daughter, who had made a terrible mistake, was now being celebrated, she was left with no choice. Claire forgave and reconciled with Therese. Even though this argument keeps coming up, apparently, <laughs> even though every time they talk about the, you know, her husband, it, it gets into an argument. That's cool, though. That is actually cool. That her actually recognizing what Therese has done. The words that she used when she faced her daughter, however, were not an apology, but a haughty. I forgive you. <laughs> now, Therese was accustomed to to dealing with difficult people on a daily basis as a temple knight, if not for that practice, and if her older brother, who knew what mother was like, had not physically stepped in between them, there would have been another fight. I do agree with that. I mean, that, that's something that I, I think everybody kind of deals with when they, they go into the workforce. Like, you live your entire life kind of dealing with people. And yeah, some people are more social with other people. They, they hang out with rougher crowds. But I think for a lot of people that have a lot of kind of anxieties and whatnot with speaking or kind of standing up for themselves, there is sort of a, a strength that you get from going into the workforce and then having to deal with a lot of people, especially customer service. A customer service can, can change a person, especially a very young person. Even this experience didn't make Claire consider forgiving Zenith. She did think, however, that if Zenith ever showed back at the gates, she might speak to her again. It was a few years later when Paul arrived at the Latria estate to ask for their help. A magical calamity had struck the kingdom of Asra, the Fatoa displacement incident. Paul was a captain of the search and rescue team, hunting down those who had gone missing, and he had come to request the assistance of the House of Latria. Again, I don't know why they wouldn't have known this already. I mean, I can even see Claire being so kind of huddled up in her own little world that she might not be caring about what that's going on in the outside world. But it's one of those aspects that I think eventually there has to get some sort of, because the the letters are going around. They're, they're sending out letters and they're looking for people that were displaced. Now, Paul, I don't, I, I think that those letters for finding people would have re arrived there before Paul traveled all the way down there because he was traveling down and helping people on the way. I don't think that he went immediately from there to here. He was working a lot up here and eventually he kind of moved down to this location, down to Millis. And thus, a lot of the letters that they're looking for people, they're searching is, is happening, would have traveled down there already. So why wouldn't she at least know that this massive displacement incident happened? Because this is a region-changing thing. It's, it's more of an aspect that because of how impactful that is to that country, where it's going to get out. Like, man, did you hear about what happened at, in, in Asra? That's crazy, really? The Fatoa region just deleted? That's crazy. They would probably... All... Here's the key thing here. The leaderships, I would assume, would be questioning what the hell happened. That's the key thing there. The royalty of Millis should be questioning what happened there. Every country in the world, if they get word of that, would be wondering what happened. Because the leadership is going to be afraid that it's some sort of secret spell or magic that somebody has developed that could be used on them. Like, could this this dis, like this entire region disappearing? Could whatever they use, could that be them testing a spell or something? And can that be used on literally in our entire country and wipe it off the map? I would think so. So it's kind of odd, again, that they don't even know about this until Paul shows up. Technically, correction, it's saying a magical calamity has struck it, and it could be implying that it's not that Paul told her, it's that that he's asking about it. Paul was a captain of the search and rescue team, hunting down those who had gone missing, and he had come to request the assistance of House of Atria. When Claire learned that Zenith was among the missing, she agreed without hesitation. She persuaded Carlisle to contribute both gold and men. Her hope was that they would find Zenith quickly, and she could tell her, Do you see now? Do you see what happened because you didn't do as I said? <laughs> Stubborn little yeah. until the end. But Zenith stayed missing. A year passed, then two. Then there was no sign of her. Zenith's husband, Paul, wasted away. 
he made no effort to conceal his suffering. And although he had a young daughter, he began to drown his sorrows in drink. Claire was the first to decide something had to be done for Norn. She decided to take her infant granddaughter from her father and foster the girl herself. She would bring her up as a proper young lady. That, Claire thought, was the most important thing. Carlisle was against it, however, and so she ultimately failed to tear the girl away from her father. As the days went by, Claire could do nothing but watch Norn and Stu in her own frustration. Very interesting. Carlisle, even right there, is like, stop. Stop. You can't take that child from her father. Stop. It's not right. But I have to. I have to control everything. I have to control. I have to control everything. Stop. Claire, stop. Now, this is making sense. I remember back when we were talking about Carlisle uh, being spoken or was being contacted by Therese. And I was like, it doesn't really make sense why all these people are rushing in to stop her. Like, again, Carlisle is super busy. They keep saying how super busy he is with these people. This guy's got an important job. And he's dropping everything to go back and say, wife, stop messing with your daughter who's lost her mind. But it seems like he is a voice of reasoning for her. Like, he is somebody who's willing to step in and say, you have to calm down. He is trying to keep her at least decently straight and narrow. Now, again, she's still treating her children badly and overly strict but he's not going to overlook something that's just kind of way way over the line again that is taking children away from their their fathers then one day paul reformed himself therese reported that his eldest son rudius had shown up beaten him and made him mend his ways this sparked within claire a flicker of curiosity about this rudius I knew it. I knew, I kind of had this feeling that eventually it's going to turn around that she actually really thinks he's amazing. I already technically slipped it out. I was kind of mentioning that when um, Carlisle met Rudius and how he pushed him to say to change his introduction. I was like, I think this guy actually has a lot of respect for Rudius and his accomplishments. And I, I kind of had that sense with Claire already. It's just that she's too damn stubborn. This flicker was doused quickly when the boy didn't present himself to the Latria family. I knew, <laughs> again, there's another case where I'm like, Rudia should have gone up there. This would have been so much e easier. It was when he was first introduced, uh, when he first came back here. It was like that whole, like, damn it, if only he didn't listen to Paul and actually gone up there and introduced himself. Paul was correct there, honestly, because if, if Rudia is his old self that at that time went and met her, he would probably say something stupid. He would say something super pervy or something like that. But here's another moment. When the boy didn't present himself, she decided that he was cut from the same cloth as his father and wrote him off in disgust. <laughs> it then came to light that Paul had two wives. His lover, Lilia, and her daughter, Aisha, came to Millis. Claire belonged to the Millis church and thus could not countenance the perversion of keeping two wives. But Paul was not an adherent, and Claire knew it was foolish to try to press her own religious convictions on another. She permitted the two girls to call upon her a few times a month and instruct them in the Latria family customs, proper etiquette, and painstaking rituals. Claire felt she was doing the natural thing by teaching them the correct way of living. Very interesting. She permitted the two girls to call upon her a few times a month and instruct them. It almost made it feel like like they were staying at the Latria stay. And they might get into it in a minute, but it kind of made it out like they were actually like Paul let him stay there for a little bit or something like that and that was when Norm was kind of doing the studies and whatnot. But I mean, that's not not to say this isn't enough. <laughs> like like this 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 these few times they went over there and visited or whatever or was called upon. Yeah, they probably didn't care for her. Like that that's enough to really kind of mess with them. Norm was constantly sulking because she was unable to measure up to Aisha. Claire despised the girl's attitude. She always gave up with sufficient effort. But Norn, afraid of being second to Aisha, stopped trying. Claire saw what was happening and told Norn there was no need for her to be the best. She needed only to live up to the reputation of a lady of the House of Latria. No, she's not a lot. Again, it's, it goes in that whole realm of like, she's going to obviously see that Norn is of the Latrias. Like she is born from that family. Yes, she's now a gray rat, but she's still a Latria. And that's the whole idea of why she's trying to push so much into her. But interesting right here to see that despite the fact that Norn is afraid of being second to Aisha and she stopped trying, Claire's seeing what was happening with her and said there was no need for her to be the best. She's saying, now again, she vocalized something different. And this is her inside. Again, she seems like she keeps things bottled up. She could still be saying to Norn, you, you know, how, oh my gosh, you're second to that 
redheaded stepchild, that that stain upon the family, that that daughter of the maid. But inside, she could be seeing something there, and she still. It says right here that she told her that she doesn't need to worry about being the best. That is interesting because I don't think they ever. I don't recall them ever mentioning Norn saying, you know, yeah, she told me one time I didn't have to worry about trying to be better than Aisha. It's sort of a positive. I'm trying to give her something here. This was Claire's version of motivation. Norn did not improve. Claire tried every speech she could think of to motivate the girl, but nothing worked. Meanwhile, she was infuriated to see Aisha, the bastard daughter, teasing Norn. Her anger made her unreasonable, and she was cruel to both the girl and her mother. In the end, both Aisha and Norn left her house as disappointments. So yeah, right there it does kind of indicate the idea of possibly being in the house physically. This could be left the house as in like discarding the, the house Latria name. But it implies the idea they were staying there for a little bit. Calling upon her every now and then to instruct them personally. But yeah. Being cruel to both Lilia and Aisha. And that's so dumb. Aisha's a child. And she's so dumb here is to be upset about that how a child teasing another child and you treat the mother and the child with like cruelly like oh, god dude and she has she's had so many children <laughs> she doesn't know how children act another few years slipped away without any news of Zenith's safe return Claire was left with only the memories of her time with her grandchildren her eldest son and eldest daughter's children came of age one by one. They all turned out splendidly. Young people she could present in any situation with surety and confidence. There was no longer any children in Claire's life, and she stopped seeing much of her grandchildren. Wow, I wonder why nobody comes to visit you. <laughs> they got lives, I know. She wondered how Aisha and Norn fared. The two would come of age soon. Now that she had thought about it, they were the only two grandchildren who hadn't turned out the way that she'd hoped. Perhaps that was to be expected of Zenith's children. She wondered how on earth Zenith had raised them. And then it hit her. She hadn't raised her own daughter. The displacement incident had occurred just after the girls had been born. Norn had been one, maybe two years old. Zenith had been robbed of the chance to know her daughters as a real person. Norn had been raised by a single father. The displacement incident could explain why Aisha had never learned to properly respect her father's legitimate daughter. Zenith had been wayward. But she was clever. Once upon a time, people had called her a model of a young lady of Millis. Venture or not, things could have been different if only Zenith had been there to teach them. Kind of surprised that she acknowledged this. It doesn't seem like it, it seems to be acknowledged very often. This idea that, yeah, this displacement in a sense screwed these kids up massively. Again, all of Reese's family got shattered. And thank, again, thank goodness, Paul was holding on to Norn, and Zenith was holding on to Aisha. Thank goodness at least that happened. Because it would have been horrible if they were alone. But yeah, at least her right here acknowledging, man, yeah, I was kind of, I didn't really realize it, but yeah, Aisha never really had that connection. Norn wouldn't have been raised by her mother. Her mother was thrown somewhere else. They were super young. This is not how normal kids grow up. Wow. It seems to make sense why they're the way they are. Now, granted, if nothing happened there, I don't think they're... I don't... Yeah, I think Zenith would have, would have raised Norn to be a little more proper, but I don't think it would have been that massively different. I don't... Okay, let me correct myself here. It's not as if the displacement incident didn't happen that, that Zenith was going to raise Norn to be what Claire would have wanted. Claire missed Zenith so much that sometimes it made her soppy. She wanted to see her daughter... Claire knew that she would probably have nothing but barbed words for her if they did meet, and that Zenith would likely cause nothing but grief for her. But even then, that might be worth it. It's the idea that, like, I know that if I see her, I'm going to exchange words. I am going to be so mad. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be, be correcting her. She messed up. I got to tell her how much she messed up. But I still want to see her. That sucks, too. Because it's like you could have so much better time when you finally meet if you just keep your mouth shut. Especially now because Zenith is an adult. That was when it happened. That was when a message came from Rudius. So it was a message first. Okay, here we go. I'm going to end your theories here. I kind of assume that a message did arrive. But the question, what happens next? Does she discard it? And then later on, she's told to look at that letter again and to answer it? That's the question. Zenith had been found. Her memory was gone. And she had lost her mind. But she was alive.
The letter from Rudius was brief and to the point, stating the facts of where Zenith had been found and her condition. It was so economical that it skimmed right past Paul's death. Rudius wrote that he planned on getting Zenith treated, but he made no mention of bringing her home. Claire wrote back immediately. She wanted to see Zenith more than anything. There is a correction. <laughs> there is a correcting path. I want to see my daughter. Now, it doesn't get into details of what her thought is right there. I have to fix her. I need to fix her. She, I, she can, I can bring her back. No fear. Just I want... She want to see her. I want to see her. Bring her back. Several more years passed, during which Claire searched for a way to cure Zenith. <laughs> Son of a... Yes! <laughs> I don't like her. This doesn't fix it, but it shows something. It shows something. It shows something. <laughs> Something's being shown here. I can take it. I'll take whatever I can get. She ran around the doctors and healing magicians of Millis and visited the library. But I think in this research, she's going to find about the curse. I still think that's going to be a thing. The curse blessing. She went around to doctors and healing magicians of Millis and visited the library of the Millis church time and time again. She even stooped to studying text written by demons in her research. And that's where it's going to come from. If if there's maybe a possibly a, a, men, a mention about Ellen Lee, possibly might be through demons. But again, they're kind of in a different... They're not demons, I know that, but still. It was unpardonable, but Claire was convinced. But there must be other cases like Zenith in history. This is so telling. Several years searched for a cure. Searched everywhere talk to doctors, healing magicians, everything, libraries, even demon text. Unpardonable. She went everywhere. She was convinced that there was other cases like her. She's, oh my gosh, it's starting to hurt. <laughs> this is starting to hurt. It doesn't change that she's an... Again, this is Refugian though. This is so Refugian. And the idea that this person is so bad. It's like Pax. So bad, but they're trying something. This character's so bad. Paul did all these bad things, but right here they're trying something. It's it is very similar to Paul's situation. Like he does all these bad things. What he did to Lilia a long time ago. Again, now having Zenith and then sleeping with Lilia again. Um, all this nasty stuff, beating the crap out of Rius over here. All these nasty things, getting drunk all the time in front of his daughter and just being stuck in a dr drunken stupor. But then he's saving people. Saving people. Saving people. Looking everywhere for people. And trying to get his family back together. Now, I've heard Claire the same way. Nasty person. <laughs> Just a, kind of a super strict and kind of a nasty person. And yes, a lot of people would see as not a very good mother. And a, and a mothership role or whatever. But then over here, then suddenly this happens. And suddenly it's like, she's doing something cool. Stop it. <laughs> Stop making me like her. Ugh. Then she finally found one. It can't be Ellen Lisa. <laughs> it can't be. I mean, this is a... Again, there's the there's a question mark here if what happens there when somebody gets transported into a crystal. I, I think back when we were talking about kind of sussing that out, that there was a possibility... I forget exactly who he was talking to at the time was trying to think about this. There was a possibility that, okay... It's not so much that it's extremely rare, the idea of, like, whenever, like, a, a displacement happens, and happens or some sort of teleportation to a random location happens, that it's as simple as, by some random luck, by, they wouldn't call it luck, by some random chance, like a point zero five million zeros one percent chance, that of all the directions and distance that she teleports to, it just happened to be, bam, right in that gym. That's crazy. But more of an idea, what the possibility that since... You know, these gems in the middle of these labyrinths are sucking in that mana. That possibility that somebody's being transported, a teleportation, a random teleportation happens that's somewhere near that, and it gets sucked into there. That's more of a, a reasoning there that I can see that being more common than the possibility of someone just random by random chance teleporting to that random location. Then finally, she found one. She had no idea if what she read could be trusted. The case she described was suspect. Unbelievable. And utterly nauseating. <laughs> I wonder if it is Ellen Lisa's nauseating because of the whole aspect of the, <laughs> the banging. But a method did exist. There was precedent for a cure. 
Or is the nauseating aspect the cure? Oh, I don't like this. I don't like this. The cure she found was not a demonic one. She read that once there was a... She read, <laughs> she read that once there had lived an elf who suffered from a similar condition to Zenith. This elf woman lost her mind, but eventually returned to herself after having intercourse with dozens of men. No! 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 You're ready? No! Where do you get this? Okay, the... I know it might explain it in a minute, but where do you get this? I, I, I'd imagine that, yes, at some point, maybe she looked into it. Maybe Ellen Lace was looking into it herself, and this is why she's given up on it. She'd never been able to find a cure. But yeah, I can see her meeting with doctors and stuff and trying to figure out her old self. But it's still like, where in that explanation does that come from? I mean, she it, it seemed like she realized herself that the reason why she was doing that was because of the curse and she was and she was feeding it, basically. Now, what is that? What is that laying to the idea that she's re she lost her mind and eventually returned to herself by having intercourse? What? This can't be Ellen Lace. It, it can't be her because where does that conclusion come from? She, she, okay, okay. If the idea was that okay, they found her in the gym, they took her to that village, and she lost all of her memories. She eventually, you know, found a man, started sleeping with him. But she had already regained, like, some sense of self at that point. She got married and everything like that. So if that's the idea of her lost mind and returning to herself, yeah. But then after that, she starts sleeping around. But that had nothing to do with her fixing her mind. What she had fixed has already been fixed. Where, where do you get this? Unless it's just musings of her. Like, possibly musings of the journey of Elise that somebody had compiled all these stories about herself into one and implied the idea that she fixed herself through sleeping with men, that it's not Elise herself talking to a doctor or whatever and coming to this conclusion from her stories, but really just somebody hearing stories about this girl that came from a gym, she was in this town, and then she slept with a bunch of men, and now she's traveling the world being an adventurer, and thus that's her being cured. It's weird. Claire could scarcely believe it. It couldn't be true. She could certain, but again, that implies what she wanted to do with Zenith and son of a... But at least it seems like her conclusion was that I want to get her married to somebody to sleep with them, possibly. Claire could scarcely believe it. It couldn't be true. She could certainly never try it. Thank you. But as she continued her research and tried to find some basis of the story, she found that the elf woman really existed. And that she was still, even now, sleeping with hordes of men. Claire didn't know what to do. Could she really attempt such a treatment? Wouldn't Zenith hate it? And yet... It may be her only chance of recovery. <sighs> it sucks that there's a... there's a. Can we be honest? Can we be honest here? And this sucks. Can we be honest that there is a small side of you that considers, would you do it? Would you be willing to do that? If my, if my daughter is not even there, she's hollow sitting there with a blank expression. And yes, technically Claire hasn't seen this yet, but she's heard about it. And so she looked into it. That if your daughter was blank like that, had nothing, lost everything, and you want to so badly see them again, and you just, you don't want this for them. You don't want them to be an empty house for the rest of her life and broken. And then you read somewhere where doing something horrific will fix them. Would you do it? I don't have an experience with somebody having lost their mind that is a female and i think it's extremely different in that case i, I hate to say that but it's I, I have to say that it seems different for me because in most in all my cases it's it's male and it's like yeah i can think about, i can, again i can I, I can honestly say there is a small side that says yeah i can't fault her thinking if it would fix them i kind of i kind of consider it not that i do it but i consider it Doing something extremely morally wrong, disgusting, unsettling, for the sake of just do this once and it fixes. That's the problem. Do this, just do this really quickly. Just get it done. Do it. We'll just say it never happened. Because at least then they'll be fixed, right? Ooh, it's, it's, a, it's a really troubling thought process here. Wouldn't Zenith hate it? That's the big thing there. She, Zenith wouldn't be choosing it. At least it's acknowledging here Zenith is not choosing this and I'm choosing it for her. And yet, it may be her only chance of recovery.
While she sat paralyzed by indecision, Rudius brought Zenith to her. Just the three of them came. Zenith, her son, Rudius, and the bastard daughter, Aisha. Even right here acknowledging she knows it's Rudius. Don't act like you didn't know it was him. He had been three years since Claire sent her letter. Claire was unaccustomed to communicating with faraway places, and so she believed Rudius had come as fast as he could. First, she thought she would tell him how much she appreciated him coming so far. Fail that, then make her introductions. Fail that. After that, she would inquire after Zenith's recovery and ask how he intended to proceed with treatment. If there was time, she would ask after Norn and Aisha. Failed all of this. I mean, he did it, technically. But the moment she saw Zenith, her plan went out the window. When Claire entered the room and saw her daughter's face, she went straight to her. Close, but never close enough. She saw Zenith's unfocused eyes, and then, feeling as though her heart would burst from her chest, she sighed impatiently and called for Ander, the family doctor. That was, again, the assumption. The, the, the hopeful assumption was that she just couldn't show it. I have to control this room. Rhea shows up. He made it so quickly. I want to go in there and thank him. Did a good job. Going to talk about this. Going to talk about this. Going to talk about this. Zenith unfocused eyes. Heart was about to burst from her chest. Ander was looking after Claire, whose health had been poor lately. Again, that was sort of the, what they were kind of indicating with the whole thing that Cliff was saying. You know, maybe she wants to find a place for her before she passes away. He had counseled her on treatment for Zenith. Claire, after finally seeing Zenith for the first time in so many years, knew it was rude to ignore Rudius and turned around to give him her attention. Then she saw who was sitting on the corner of the sofa, a woman in a maid outfit with dark brown hair and a face Claire would never forget. Right then, her attention was more caught by the outfit, though. A maid outfit? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm reading without reading it out loud. I knew this was going to happen. I knew this was going to happen. It's tunnel vision. I said that. It the, the moment that Rudius mentioned something about the fact that some things were said, and I think he implied this idea of like, it, it almost like a, a tunnel vision effect happened. He only heard what he wanted to hear. And that's what I kept saying. There's going to be something here that we're missing. There's going to be words that are not being said. Rurius accounted for a lot of things, but he didn't account for everything. And I kept wanting, I, I, I even wondered, I think it was last Michigan Monday, I was wondering about this idea of, with the possibility that Aisha heard it, but for some reason she's not telling Rurius. Like, yeah, he, he, she said something about that. Did you forget about that, brother? But she doesn't like Claire either. There's so much that Rurius didn't even talk about. Again, we have to keep reminding ourselves that in most cases, this story is wrote from Rudius. Like, it's almost like his diary. It's an extremely detailed diary of himself that he's writing every single minute. And thus, when a blackout happens, when a tunnel vision happens, he's not hearing a bunch of stuff. He's only hearing what he wants to hear. And I think there is an element of him coming in there with all of these nasty stories about Claire, and thus he's only gonna, he's gonna pick up words in his own way. Now, it could be the reverse here, that we're now getting Claire. Now, this is more spoken from a, this is actually a third person perspective. So this isn't Claire saying what happened there. It's saying what she did. And then her attention, not, and then my attention was caught off guard. This is the third person. So this should tell the whole story here. Aisha, how lovely to see you again. What? Or what capacity have you come here in? Oh, um, I'm Lady Zenith's, um, I mean, I'm, I'm helping look after her. Claire couldn't help the harsh words that slipped out at her at this response. Look after her? In other words, Aisha was here as Zenith's maid? And if that were true, there was no possible excuse for Aisha to sit while her master and mistress stood. Claire merely reprimanded her to remind her of common decency. Rius, whoever, came between them. Again, I think that was a, a Rius L right there. Like, he shouldn't have had her come there in a maid outfit. As well as the boy could, Claire herself was the one who had abandoned propriety. Now she saw Rudius for the first time. She noted his strong resemblance to Paul. She couldn't help but see Paul's face in his. Paul, the drunk. Paul, who led Zenith to the state. Thank you, Claire. No. <laughs> Again, this is third person, but it's saying it's saying that basically she's thinking about how Paul led Zenith to this Yay! state. No. No. Zenith left you. And then she happened to be in Buena Village with Paul. And the displacement incident happened. 
He didn't lead her to being mindless at the moment. I hate, I hate, hate the idea of blaming people. This is purely what I believe. This is not saying this is true. I am not a medical doctor. I have no field in science. I, I'm, I'm not an expert in this at all. But I feel, I feel like a big contributing factor to my father losing his mind was his doctors putting him into a sleep state to work on him in a surgery too long. And thus, it degraded his mind. Because the moment he came out of his surgery, he was out of it. He was losing himself. He quickly got dementia. Not to say that he wasn't prone to getting dementia. He could have had early sets of it. But the moment he had that surgery, it's like it pushed it to the progress. It pushed the progress bar to 90%. From maybe 5% to 90%. But you don't see me going to the hospital and blaming them for that. My father chose to do that surgery. And, he, and there's the risk there. And I, and, I, and I can't imagine the idea of, say, blaming uh, the consultant that he should do that. Blaming his work. Anybody around him for allowing him to have the surgery or anything that may have led it up to that point. It just happened. And I think the idea of blaming somebody for something that really he has no control over, just trying to find somebody to blame it on, is frustrating. I hate it. All resentment towards the boy's father came rushing back. Perhaps that was why, in the conversation that followed, Claire's less admirable qualities reared their heads. Her vanity and stubbornness took the reins. She brushed aside the dim awareness of her own faults and dug in. Ruiz, on the other hand, was a forthright young man. He met her spiteful comments with well-reasoned and direct arguments. His frank candidness made Claire revise her opinion of him. After that, their conversation proceeded according to her expectations. First, they spoke about the progress of Zenith's treatment, then Norn's situation. She did not ask about Aisha, still embarrassed over her earlier outburst. Larissa's knowledge of basic Mill's customs was a little lacking, but he seemed aware of his responsibility as head of his family and was taking Norn's cultivation seriously. Claire began to see him in a different light. He was young, but he took his role seriously. He was upstanding young man. At least that's how he looked to her. She had no notion of how important the role of the Dragon God support in it was. That's kind of funny. <laughs> Like at the same time, she's being like nasty and he's kind of retorting positively or whatever. And he's, she's like, he's doing well, but it's like, he's a good man. And inside of his head's like constantly, crap, what do I do here? What do I do here? <laughs> she doesn't have no idea what's going through his head. It's like the whole like meme where there's like a person sitting there and they're perfectly calm and then it kind of goes into their head and it's screaming. Her knowledge of military matters was lacking, but close ties to the monarch of Asra had to imply a certain degree of status. Even if a new line had taken the throne, with greater status comes greater responsibility and greater accomplishments. Claire gleaned that Rudius was a figure far more important than she had previously thought. This was Zenith's son. Won't say the other one. This is Paul's son. No, Zenith. He's doing good. It's a good kid. It's gotta be Zenith's son. <laughs> it's my bloodline. <laughs> I'm, I'm probably thinking too much in that. The thought called up complicated mix of irritation and pride within her. Unfortunately, he'd be a problem. The course of treatment she had planned for Zenith was sure to cause talk. Handing a woman over to a procession of men to have their way with her was an unforgivable sin. She's still thinking about it. She tried to ask leading questions to probe Rhea's likelihood of accepting her plan, but in the end only made him explode with her. She was trying to prod him there by saying, oh, I'm just going to get him off to a man. Get him to a man. She could still have a child. That was her prodding. Let's get comfortable first. <laughs> prodding? That's your idea of prodding? Get to know each other first. And then bring it up to him. This shouldn't be the way that you go about it. Say Rudius. Okay. This is gonna this is gonna be a little bit rough, Rudius. But I I found something. I found a cure. Rudius would be like ears. Ears are receptive. Yes, Radar is ready for... Send whatever you're going to pitch. Like, I'm ready. Let's go. <laughs> Game ball. <laughs> like, like, if you just open it up with, I have a plan, I have a cure, and I want to present it to you. Ruse would be all ears. Then explain it. Explain it. Now, it seems like she's indicating here that she didn't want him involved with it, but she's trying to get his idea of if he would be receptive of it. 
Just say what it is. Rather than say, I'm just going to marry a mindless daughter off to a guy and they'll have a child. That's worse. That's worse. Now, the, the, if you're wanting to meet the middle there somewhere, it could be as simple as saying that, yeah, I have a cure for it. It's going to require her to, you know, bed a man. And so I'm thinking of marrying her out to somebody. That way that can happen with at least somebody that will take care of her in the future and take care of that child and all this kind of stuff. Like, there's so many better ways to process than the way you did it, girl. Claire saw that his love for Zenith, even in her current state, was undiminished. But of course it was. Nothing could have made him brave the years-long journey to bring Zenith to Millis. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> sure, let her believe that one. Claire Proving also confirmed that he hadn't tried the treatment she planned and didn't know of his existence. Again, is this a... Did she talk about it? Okay, we've already established that there's a tunnel vision happening here. There's a tunnel vision happening here. Did she really bring up the idea of the treatment? Did she bring up the elf and everything and Rudy didn't hear any of that? Because again, by this moment, he's in tunnel vision mode because she had already brought up the idea of marrying it off and she was saying, prodding him. Granted, I didn't say what she prodded him with, but did she actually talk about all this? She wondered whether she ought to tell him about it. Again, Claire's probing also confirmed that he hadn't tried the treatment she planned. Okay, so she's saying basically when she was talking to him about what they've done so far, he didn't say, well, I've had her sleep with like 15 men and it didn't work. Oh, you heard about that one too? <laughs> what does that come up in a conversation? So what have you done? Yeah, we're trying a few things like Lilia and and Sylphie. They they got a couple things they're doing with her on a regular basis. I mean, we take her out to the garden. I she, she goes out with the garden all the time with Aisha, you know. Um, and yeah, one time we had about 15 guys come in and just a full on, just all over her. Didn't work. You know, we, we tried everything. How does that come up? She wondered if she ought to tell him about it to explain that while it might strain credulity, it might get Zenith back. It was even possible that if she explained it all, he might give her his consent, but something gave her pause. This was a young man with a bright future ahead of him. Word had it that he was a close friend of the priests in the Pope's faction. She had also heard the Pope's grandson had returned to Milshin recently himself. Again, there's that like inconsistency that I almost feel in people knowing who P Cliff is. It's weird. Given the length of the journey, she wouldn't be surprised if he and Rurius had made the journey together. Claire herself had no interest in church power struggles. Interesting there. But what if Rudius began to work on behalf of the Pope's faction? What if he made his name in the Milshin, not as a Latria, but as a Grey Rat and follower of Orsted and member of the Populist? The treatment Claire was planning could ruin his prospects. I was, I was building into this, but I was waiting to see if it really confirms it. <laughs> Interesting. Very interesting. She doesn't care about the power struggles. She doesn't care about the politics. Again, from Ryusa's perspective, this entire time in this town is the Latrias and that who are part of the Cardinalists and they're against the Pope and the Pope's faction and Cliff's a part of that faction. And these two, they see things differently with the demons. These ones are the expulsionists and these are the inclusionists and they're against each other. There's cutthroat. Everybody's after each other. And there's a blessed child. And that's the speaking of hope and they're getting better then over here claire's going i don't care my daughter's back i want to fix my daughter and i have to do this thing that again is going to be seen as really bad and rudius is part of them and this will be really bad for him what claire right here is saying rudius really shouldn't be involved with what i'm about to do because that could make him that could ruin his future if people found out that Rudius was involved in what I'm about to do with Zenith in order to fix my daughter, he will look bad. What? What? <laughs> that's a shocker. That's, that's, that's a shocker. I'm going to admit it. If it got out that he had done such a thing with his own mother, it would be a scandal. Every citizen of Millis would gossip behind his back. It would be impossible for him to remain in this country. And this is, again, her – she's not even thinking about herself. Now, she probably has already kind of dedicated this what she's going to do. She's going to accept the results or whatever. But this is all – this explains why that – the end of that meeting happened the way that – the previous chapter, the way it ended that way is because she's sitting there and she knows if she says what she's going to do with Zenith, it is going to look extremely bad. This will destroy the Latria name. This will destroy all my family. My daughter, who's standing right over there, is going to ruin Rudius. It's going to look nasty upon everybody in our family. She was going to take it to the grave. Even Rudius, 
she just met him, but she sees he has hopes. And possibly also, again, says earlier, the son of Zenith, my daughter who I'm trying to save. And again, mentioning earlier that she's about, that she's got problems right now. Physically, it, it indicates that she is not going to have much longer. She's wanting to essentially do a horrible deed in secrecy and take it to the grave. As long as I can leave Zenith alive and Ruiz is alive and they will never have to accept this stain. There's a self-sacrifice aspect here, even though there's so much wrong circling it. Even though she's horrible at communicating, she's kind of na she's nasty, and even though she's about she wants to do a very horrible act. There is a sense here that she's trying to yes, it will have to involve Zenith and it's again horrible. We, 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 when I was talking about this previously, yeah. Yeah. excuse Claire. No, I'm trying to understand her side here. And I can see that there's a little bit of a, a, a self-sacrifice, even though, again, I think the worst of it's for Zenith. What Zenith is going to have to go through is the worst of it all. No doubt. So Claire debated with herself. Was it right to tell him? Was it right to burden him with it? No, he had to know nothing. It was better for him to stay ignorant about his mother being forced to sleep with all those men better that he had nothing to do with it at all. It would be all Claire's decision. Rius wasn't a member of the Latria family, and so he had nothing to do with it. That, she thought, would be best. She never considered giving up carrying out the treatment. She had waited 20 years for this, for the opportunity to see Zenith again, to speak to her. I hate this so much, because it's like, I hate the cure. <laughs> the cure is so disgusting. It's so misled. Again, I don't know who wrote that and how they came to that conclusion or if she's completely taking out of context what that whole thing happened. Again, that's got to be Elise. And then <laughs> nothing to do with it. It has nothing to do with it. She has never got her memories back. Where did that conclusion come from? And again, I have to admit there's like a small sign that's like, yeah, would you do it? It's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. But it's like do it and just kind of move on with your life. It's kind of like the whole Roxy sleeping with Rhea's the first time thing. It's like, it's so wrong, but like, just do it and just let's move on with our life and act like it never happened kind of thing. It's, and it, but, it, it, but it's so morally wrong though. This is so off the bounds, morally wrong. Thus Claire set her plan in motion. She would bear the disgrace of this by herself. She deliberately antagonized Rudius, then disowned him from the Latria family. Then she finally had a servant abduct Zenith. So this is implying that she didn't, that there was not really much tunnel vision happening when he finally like snapped. Again, he did sort of disclude some things that happened with her comments to Aisha, because I think it with Aisha, it, just, it jumped straight to saying, what are you doing sitting there with that on stand up, all that kind of stuff. At this point, however, her plan ground to halt. Zenith was brought back to the house. She was an adult now and she was getting older, but she was still beautiful. She was still a desirable lady. Most of all, she was Claire's daughter. Claire couldn't bring herself to force Zenith to sleep with some untold number of men. It wasn't right. It couldn't be. At the same time, though, it wasn't right to expect Zenith's son to continue to care for his mother in her current state. Claire even made the excuse to herself. If Zenith could speak, she would ask Claire to cure her, surely. Again, that's that whole conundrum with, with speaking for somebody. It's so, it's so difficult. Again, that was like that, that comment that was made. If, if Zenith could say something, she said that she would say that this was better or something like that. It was like, ugh, it sucks the idea even speaking for somebody else. I mean, you can, you can understand them to a degree. But again, my argument there was that you don't know my mom. You have not been there with her. And again, I was arguing that Rudius could have known her longer at that point, especially post everything that happened. Now, knowing her longer in her right mind, no. And I would even argue more so in the idea that Rudius wasn't really trying to connect with Zenith back then. But again, right here, it does sort of correct it in the idea that it is at least going, I can't have her like go into a room full of men. At least, again, it kind of implying going in the direction of her getting married. At least having a guy that would hopefully take care of her. Hopefully find a good man. She wanted someone to stop her. She was about to do something terrible, but she couldn't stop herself. She wavered, agonized, and fought with herself. She spent every day in Zenith's room. Her face buried in her hands. Zenith sat there blankly, not doing anything. Every now and then, though, she would display human interaction, and Claire would be racked with indecision once again. There's times where, like, 
with somebody in such a far off state and you just you so badly want to be there at their side but there's almost an element of it that you just sometimes you have to step away because and now when my when I was dealing with a lot of this stuff it wasn't like I was trying to make some decision to do some crazy thing in order to fix them because there was just this idea that you can't there's nothing there's nothing there's nothing you can do so it's not really so much of like sitting there agonizing over you, what you could do to help them, but more so just having to be at their side is so agonizing. And every now and then they show us some sort of sign that they are acknowledging something, and it just it hits you every time. In the end, it was Carlisle who put an end to her suffering. Carlisle heard a summary of the events from Therese. Now, that's a good point. If she was constantly looking for somebody to stop me, I'm going to do something crazy. Please, somebody just kind of stop me. But then I'm trying to because I want to fix this. That explains possibly why she slipped out to Therese that she had Zenith. It wasn't a oopsie. She found out somehow. No, she probably told Therese. Subconsciously, she wanted Therese to find somebody to stop her. Then got the rest from the family doctor, Ander. He learned what the treatment was and how Claire was agonizing over whether to go through with it. When he learned of the unforgivable acts that his wife was considering, he went to her and he was kind. Before you go through with this, he told her, first allow the blessed child to see her. Okay. A lot here. This does at least confirm that he made it. Like, it feels like, again, from Maurice's perspective, it's like, Teresa's like, I'm going to get father here. He's coming over. He's going to see. He's going to stop everything. Don't worry. But it almost felt like he didn't get to Claire before they got stuck over here with this meeting. Like, it, it almost felt like this is the first time that... Carlisle was even there in the presence of Zenith and Claire. But no, he made it there. And he wanted her to see the blessed child. If they knew Zenith's memories, that might shed light on the situation. Or could be a chance you could see something in her memories that implies what she wants. Again, I keep saying this. There is a there's a lot in this whole situation about just losing the ability to communicate. Everything in the brain, there's areas of the brain that does different things. And like I've had I've had situations where like a multiple scrose or something like that knocks out the ability to move. And you have to reteach the person how to move their limbs again. Like they're just stuck in a certain position. They can't do it. And you almost have to kind of bend their arms out. And you have to make them flex it in a certain way over and over again. They keep failing and they want to give up. And you have to keep moving their arm over and showing them is basically to retrain the brain how each of the limbs works. It's one of those things we take for granted the ability to do this. There's so much happening in your brain just doing this, just pumping your fist like this. There's so much that's happening in your brain. Every single muscle and tendon, everything is communicated to by the brain. And you have to reteach the brain how to do that. And yes, part of that is speech. She could be have something in there where she's thinking about what mom's about to do. And she's probably thinking to herself, stop, mom, stop, mom, stop, mom, stop, mom. And they, she just can't say it. Again, I keep saying that. I, would, I just have that feeling. And I always have that feeling with my family members. Whether somewhere in there they're trying to say, I love you. Or please don't do that. Or just let me go. Don't worry. Just let me go. And they just can't, they can't verbalize it. Or Goodbye. <laughs> It might be what still the resolve, or maybe it be the thing that would finally allow them to let go. If they, if we find out that the blessed child has already seen Zenith, I'm gonna be so mad. <laughs> Don't tell me they actually seen the blessed child. It's just I'm I'm right here, right here. with stop. I'm thinking the blessed child orchestrated this in order to get that room. It, like there's there's a like she's behind a lot of things, and it was all for the sake of getting. Anyways. Carla submitted an application to have Zenith's memories read by the blessed child. He wielded all the influence he could muster as a senior captain in the Temple Knights to procure an audience while keeping Zenith's name off the application. He made sure Rudius didn't catch wind of it. The blessed child, who officially never examined personal memories, would do exactly that for them that very day. As Carl, oh, okay, so <laughs> it didn't happen yet. <laughs> okay, it didn't happen yet. As Carlyle and Claire quietly escorted Zenith to the church headquarters to see the blessed child, Rudius abducted her. Okay, that would explain why they're there. So we're, we're just gonna, this is gonna turn into one of those things where it's just like, okay, it's not as big as you think it is, but it is still, I still think there's a lot here that the Pope's behind. 
But at least this kind of takes them out of the picture. At least it takes... Now, again, the reason Claire got that information could be the man god. There's still a chance it could be geese. And that is how we ended up here. Carlisle finished. Claire's eyes were red, and Carlisle's face was lined with sorrow. There was a few different reactions from around the table. A few grimaces, a few frowns, and folded arms. Therese had her hands over her mouth in shock. The blessed child smiled as though she'd known the details all along. Crafty girl, dude. I <laughs> I just hope it's not malicious. I just hope it's not malicious. Cliff's face was unreadable, which made me wonder if maybe... This is Rudy's perspective, by the way. I'm not sure if I mentioned that earlier. Cliff's face was unreadable, which made me wonder if maybe he had heard this story before somewhere. So Rudeus isn't picking up on this? Rudeus is not picking up on this story? Oh my gosh. And I guess there could be another elf that had gone through this whole thing, and it could be possibly not Elise. But again, Elise is a case where it's proven it doesn't fix anything, and that's that would be my immediate reaction to speaking up. I know that won't fix it because I know somebody, and they do that a lot. It might be the same person. It all make perfect sense now that it hurt it. What Claire had planned was unforgivable. She hadn't gone through it with it. But the fact that she thought about doing that to her own daughter was enough. I wasn't about to forgive her for it. And it was sure as hell wasn't a cultural difference or acceptable under Mill's church doctrine. I wasn't sure if it was actually constituted as a crime in Millis. But from the reactions I was seeing here, she definitely succeeded in disgracing the house of Latria. If I had betted her, it hardly needed to be said that I'd have to kiss goodbye to any hopes of doing business in this town. And that was why she disowned me. Why she had tried to do it all herself. She struggled over the decision alone and planned to take all the punishment alone. But no, it, it was still wouldn't fix what she was doing. Again, that's a whole conundrum of like, yeah, it's nice that she was doing that by herself and trying to take it all upon herself. But in doing so, she doesn't get the opinion of other people who are going to say, no, don't do that to her. Please, someone stop me. But you won't tell them what you're doing. <laughs> the thing, though, was that Claire had her facts wrong. Was that um treatment? Was it from 200 years ago by any chance? I asked. Claire looked up and surprised. It, it was, she said, around 200 years ago. It said there was a woman in the same state, and that woman was driven away from her village for what she did. You know the story. Does that mean you tried it? Of course not, I said. The other case that Claire had found had to be Elise. The story Claire knew was a pretty generous massaging of the facts, of course. Yes, Elise had been in the same state as Zenith, but after a few decades, she got better. It wasn't until later that she turned into a total slut. <laughs> To be fair, it was in the nature of the old stories to get mixed up as they get passed down. It made sense that it got twisted in the retelling. I didn't try that treatment, I went on, but I did meet the woman and heard the story directly. I guess I hadn't put Elise in my letter. I kept way too much secret back then. I, I see, Claire said. Yeah, that, that's true. And again, I don't see him doing that. Again, she said that it was like a very, um, it was a very simple st uh, writ letter that he wrote to her. Like it, it, she even said that it glossed over the fact that Paul died. It was a very simple letter that he was sending out, and that's what arrived to her. So yeah, it's not going to have him go through like every single detail of everything he did. Like I sat down with Orsted, I sat down with Pedagus. These were things that he was telling him later, or when she was when he was face to face with her. And yeah, he's not going to get into details about Ellen Lace and everything. Which yes, is technically is something he probably should have brought up with her. But again, their first meeting was <laughs> kind of went to crap quick. <laughs> but yeah, that would probably have been a good thing to bring up to her. I know a similar case, and it doesn't seem too promising. I see, Claire said. Her shoulders slumped like she had been deflated. In her face, though, I thought I saw something like relief. Well, of course, because she didn't want to do it. She didn't want to do it. She was going to do it, which is un unforgivable, but she thankfully didn't, and now she's relieved that she won't. It does kind of suck, though. She'd been trying, she'd been suffering about this for the longest time, for that she, if she was going to do it or not. Everything I did was for nothing then. Yep, I agreed. I see. If she told me her plans way back on day one, I wouldn't have gotten so mad. Whoa there, Grandma, I would have said, laughing her off. I know the woman you're talking about, and you got the whole story wrong. <laughs> How could you think that would work? Yeah, I mean, probably. You should have told me, I said. If you hadn't known any other way to make her better, would you have been able to resist trying it? I didn't reply. I didn't know how to answer. I couldn't just say no. If Annalise had told me... Even he's thinking about, thank you. At least I don't feel bad. I don't know what the chat's saying right now about me saying there's a side there. And again, it's just, that's human nature. You're going to think of what if. The what if. Because if you have experienced somebody being lost like that, you would think about trying anything to save them. 
anything, anything, anything possible. If Annalise told me screwing around cured me, I might have done it, but not right away. I would have tried anything else first, but a few years had passed since I met Annalise. If nothing had worked, how would I feel now? After dwelling on it for years, who knew what decision I might have reached? Yeah, and I think with um, Claire, I think it's a lot more, it's her daughter. And again, Rudeus, yes, Zenith is Rudeus' mother. But again, I still question how bond he is with her. These these recent chapters has shown me at least that he is like, I will burn down this town for her. But I don't, I, I haven't gotten like, a, I haven't felt like a love, a mom love. It's different. And maybe it's just how it's portrayed. I don't feel a mom love. I feel a, I'm pissed because she couldn't make the decision and I made it for her and Paul left me to take care of her and I'm going to do what Paul told me to do. I will make sure my father, again, I'm his son. I will make sure to protect her with my life. I haven't got a sense of, it's my mom. With Claire, yeah, she's going to be a lot more... I could see her being a lot more irrational about the situation upon seeing, especially upon seeing Zenith's face. I want my daughter back and I'll do anything for her. But again, I love the fact that he's willing to say I would consider it. But unlike Claire, which I appreciate this much more, I would try anything else first. <laughs> anything else first. To think you knew, and still I, of all the foolish, Claire began to cry. If only, like, it's like, it's if only I'd asked you, I wouldn't have done all this crap. I wouldn't even, the fear is more Claire thinking to herself, possibly, what if I had gone through it just to find out it didn't do anything? And then you told me I knew it wouldn't work. Why didn't you ask me? After finding out that she tried to subject her daughter to horrible abuse for nothing, maybe she never wanted to see her daughter again. Maybe there was still some bad blood there. Maybe she still had some mixed emotions. Me though, I felt great. Everything Claire has said and done finally made sense. When she said, for the good of my daughter and my family, Claire had been telling the truth. And now here we were. And this huge production was because our falling out got picked up and used to gain the upper hand in a power struggle. Yep. Claire did her best to keep everyone else unaware of and therefore not involved in her plan to her credit. I guess she wanted to protect the Latria family from disgrace. Therese and the uncle an aunt I still hadn't met, but she'd gone about it all wrong. There just wasn't any other side of this. There had to have been a better option, all kinds of better options. Even so, she had done it for Zenith and for me, for the good of my daughter and my family. I guess that's why Zenith slapped me and Carlisle. I sighed. Then I remembered Cliff, Cliff, who tried to protect Claire. So Cliff, when did you first hear about all this? I asked. This morning, I ran into three of them when they arrived at the church this morning, he replied. And you didn't try to stop them then? You know all about Elnace, don't you? The only thing they told me about the treatment is that it was something no decent person would condone. So they took them in and questioned them at that point? Because my, my, my thought process there is that he, he ran into them that morning because they were supposed to meet up with the blessed child, but they weren't going to tell them what they were doing. So they must have captured them at that point and then questioned them. But it seems like this is all something that Carlisle is is, is um, confessing. But I guess right here he says that he's just saying that's something that no decent person would condone. Hmm. All right. I guess that follows. After all this time confining in no one, Claire wasn't about to just spill the entire thing to Cliff. I meant to tell you today, but then he trailed off. I'm sorry. Then all this went down and you never had the chance. This was Cliff we were talking about. I was prepared to bet that he really laid in on Claire and Carlisle. What you're doing is wrong. Return Zenith and apologize to Rudius, that sort of thing. Then Carlisle, cowed by Cliff's anger, confessed. Cliff probably felt uneasy at something no decent person would condone. Maybe they made him swear confidentiality. That was why here, in front of all the others, he tried to argue with me instead of saying any of this out loud. He thought that he could just stop things there. If he could get through to me, that Claire really had Zenith's best interest at heart, there would be a chance for reconciliation. I couldn't exactly say it was a good plan. Still, it was drafted out of consideration for Claire and Carlisle. It was Cliff through and through. The important thing here was that I had all the pieces at last. Talk about relief. I'm just kind of, I guess I'm more puzzled that they were willing to tell Cliff about all this. Again, they kept it vague in the idea of something decent and wouldn't be condoned. But still, like, why would they, why would they even talk to Cliff? 
unless the Pope is pushing him out into an authoritative position, which he's not yet, it doesn't make any sense why Cliff has this control. He has nothing to do with the blessed child. If they were coming to see the blessed child, why would they see Cliff? They just ran into him. They'd be like, whatever, we're doing our own thing. We ain't got time to talk. It's weird that he actually got the ability to actually sit down and talk to them. Just as I was feeling good about things, Cliff looked around the whole room and said, all right, allow me to ask again. We heard that all of this came down to a mother trying to help her daughter. Do you still mean to claim that ganging up on this woman to use as a scapegoat in your schemes is the will of St. Millis? The Pope wore his ever-friendly smile. The Cardinal still looked sulky. The Cardinal Knights and the Temple Knights looked relieved, if anything else. All eyes were on Cliff. Cliff standing up. Cliff's like a bro. This incident was all a big misunderstanding, he continued. Fortunately, not one person was killed. This affair all started with a mother's love. I admit, time was wasted and losses were sustained in the confusion that ensued. Some of you have suffered temporary discomfort or injury, but is any of that so important? Can't we let bygones be bygones? Can't we forgive this woman? Show some mercy? Cliff looked at me. <laughs> Cliff is literally taking over the room and showing himself as being a very forgiving person, which is, but he's still showing strength. That's the key thing there. He's not just saying, let's all be friends and hug. He's showing strength. And again, he's he's speaking on the word, the word of their, of, of Millis. Reese, the power to decide is yours. You have suffered the most here, and you have won the right. I let go of the blessed child ages ago, I thought, but she was still sitting beside me, and still smiling like nothing she'd heard had surprised her, like she was real smarty pants, seeing through it all. That sounds fair to me, I said calmly. There was still some bad blood between us, but I'd make time to have a good long chat with Claire later. If she was the person I thought she was, we should be able to sort that out if we talked it out. She'd probably do something to irritate me along the way, but that was a normal part of knowing people. However, I have three conditions, I said, then laid out my demands. First, I want the blessed child to look at my mother's memories and see if she can fix her. I addressed this to the cardinal, but it was the blessed child who replied, of course I will. We already had it scheduled after all. She still had that knowing attitude. Had she known that she was going to examine Zena today? Did she let herself get kidnapped because she knew? They manipulated this meeting. It was plausible. Yeah, that's, that's the interesting thing. He's like, okay, things are sorted out. And yeah, I, I'm going to let this be. But then he's turning it into an, uh, uh, an ability to sort of get a benefit out of this, which is kind of interesting because he probably should have brought this up a while ago. But yeah, if you still have the cards in your hand, secure the blessed child for Zenith. Because if you walk out that door, again, they've already indicated here, you can't use this blessed child for your own personal gain. So at least secure that for the future. <laughs> That's a good thing. However, she added, I do not have the power to restore lost memories. I doubt that it's one of my abilities to cure her. Even so, I like to try it. No objections from you, your eminence. The cardinal made a noise of assent. <laughs> he seemed to be in a good mood. Yeah, he didn't lose a big key player. Probably because he knew his allies, the Latrias, were getting out of some more or less scot-free. Yeah, it is partly because the Latrias are really a, a key asset to him. And he doesn't want to lose Claire and Carlisle, especially Carlisle. But there's also a domino effect that comes from them getting in trouble. That if Carlisle and Claire end up getting, you know, charged for something really bad, again, it pretty much indicates that Claire has pretty much already been judged at that point. And then Carlisle was something where he was going to receive some sort of punishment for it as well. That would look bad upon their faction. This is seeming like they're going to wipe their hands of this. Thus, nothing really bad comes out of this room, possibly. Second, in exchange for my letting all this go, I expect your full and unqualified cooperation with the dragon god Orsted. Shall be so, the Pope said. He was a given. But the Cardinal nodded, too, and muttered, fine. I might have been able to demand the reserved figurines, I thought. Part of me wanted to try it. But I decided it was better to wrap this up on a positive note. <laughs> Things were fine for now. If I got greedy, it might bite me in the butt later. Now, my third and final condition. I said, I looked over at Claire and Carlisle. They stood still as stone, staring me back. I asked to be reinstated as a member of the Latria family. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Why? I mean, this. I guess this kind of piggybacks off of all the discussion with um, Therese. Where he's like sort of slowly getting closer to all the other family members. He's realizing they're good people. Like the, again, his aunts and uncles, they're rushing over. They're trying to stop. And Carlisle's talking about going over there and stopping it. And he's talking, he's always like Therese. It was only Claire. Claire was his only problem. And now he's finally found out what Claire was trying to do and what she was struggling with. And all this stuff, and it was all just kind of the fact that she was massively misled. So I can see him possibly going, I want to 
I want to know my mom's family. I think that's a lot of it. I want to know my mom's family. I want to know them better. I want to know my grandma. I want to know my grandpa. Interesting. This is how the Mills incident drew to a close. The first to react was Therese. Her hand went over her breast as she gasped. Carlisle lowered his head, looking ashamed. And Claire started crying with a big hiccup and sobs. She was saying something that could have been thank you and could have been I'm sorry. It was hard to tell through the sobs. As Claire wept, Zenith laid a hand on her head. And that is chapter six. Maurice is going to join the family again. Damn, now that I finished this chapter, this should have gone with chapter five. I feel like this should have been with five. Y'all suck that said this should be with seven. This should have been with five. Chapter seven, what is owed? We put the agreement in writing. It spelled out everything that had happened, the whole sordid affair. And it said only Rudius' good character had kept the blessed child from harm. It placed the blame with the Millish Church and stipulated that in accepting liability, the Holy Millish Church would make restitutions by comprehensively supporting the activities of the Dragon God Orsid and Rudius Grey Rat. The contract wrapped up with something along the lines of the pertaining activities may involve demons, but shall not extend to any act that violates the laws of Millis. That's surprising they're going that far for it. And I guess that's really around the Pope and what he's sort of doing with this whole situation. He wants Rius as an ally. Cause that's, that seems like an overextension right there. For the church to really kind of publicly, seemingly, publicly announce that they are in the wrong. The two principal culprits, the Pope and the Cardinal, signed it like it was no big deal. The nervous sweat rolling down the Cardinal's face was honestly kind of adorable. <laughs> the contract was signed. My hostage returned and the gathering concluded. Apparently the decision reached by our provisional court would later be reviewed by an evaluation council that would assign liability to all the relevant parties, whatever that involved. I bet the Cardinal would find a way to wriggle out of it. Chasing down the guilty wasn't my job. If they weren't disciples of the man god, they weren't my enemies. Just annoyances. Also, taking out the Cardinal wasn't the same thing as wiping out the demon expulsionists. I got in what I came for and sorted out the attack in the garden. Call it a win. Zenith Cliff and I set out for his place. On the way, Cliff blurted out, I'm sorry. Wait, what are you talking about? I replied, a bit lost. When I thought about it, I realized that it's my fault Zenith remained captive as long as she did. I wasn't careful enough. Everything worked out in the end, but I feel like I just made things worse by thinking that I could smooth everything over. So is this implying that he knew a bit longer? I thought it implied that he knew that morning. Reese thought, isn't that your whole shtick? <laughs> You use a bunch of mistaken assumptions to make a big, illogical speech, but in the end, everyone ends up happy. This is who you are as a person, Cliff. I'm not holding it against you. Let's try to learn from this, so we can do better next time. Yes, of course, he replied. Cliff was feeling down, but personally, I was more worried about what it would do to his career. Wendy was waiting for us as we got home, just Wendy alone. Oh, welcome home, she said. I was struck by sudden unease. Were Aisha and Geese all right? When the contract was written up, I try to casually ask about them, but the Cardinal and the Temple Knights had basically said, don't know, don't care. <laughs> Miss Aisha and Master Geese are both safe and sound, Wendy continued, and my paranoia evaporated. The two of them came up from the basement. Big brother, you're back. And, oh, Mother Zenith. The two of them told me what happened. They got word that Claire and Carlisle had left their house early that morning to go to the church headquarters. So they headed to the church headquarters themselves to try to tip me off. By the time they got there, though, it was already too late. The Temple Knights were in an uproar. Claire was at the church. I was there too, trying to get close to Therese. They put two and two together and assumed we'd run into each other and clashed. At that point, they remember the order that I gave them back at Cliff's house. They got our things packed for a quick escape, then hid in the back of the house. They planned to get out of the city when night fell. Those Temple Knights showed up a few times, but I sent them on their way, Wendy said. She was doing her job properly. A small mercy. <laughs> Finally, she's doing a good job. <laughs> but the Cardinal had tried to get Aisha and Geese. What a nightmare. Yeah? Anyways, you got mother back. Does that mean... Yeah, it's all over, I said. I told Aisha and Geese everything that happened. After I finished, Aisha sighed with admiration. Big brother, you're like totally a hero or something, she said, her eyes sparkling. Everyone is just screwing everything up. Then one day, bam, call to adventure. A stranger comes to town. Then he mysteriously returns where he came from. Don't be stupid, I thought. <laughs> I'm not handsome enough to be a leading man. We arranged to take Zenith back to the blessed child the following day. Carlisle and Claire came to Cliff's house by carriage to get with us, and the five of us, Cliff included, set off together. Inside the carriage, I had a chance to talk to Carlisle. He seemed majorly cut up about everything and kept apologizing to me. I wasn't interested in pointing fingers. Maybe he could have handled things a bit better, but hey, people made mistakes. It's a good, good way of seeing it. The important thing is that you learn from them. 
Yeah, I think that's a positive thing about this whole thing. Like, yeah, a lot of really bad things happen. And the, the, again, they were going to do something that was really horrible, but they were kind of trying some things first. And in the end, nothing bad happened. Just mistakes happened. Mistakes that could have been extremely bad if it went wrong. But in the end, move forward kind of thing. The important thing is that you learn from them so that you can do better in the future, right? Besides, I couldn't claim to be doing well on that front. Who was I to start harping on other people about their screw-ups? How was anyone supposed to move forward if you kept digging it up? Not that it was my job to make sure that any of them were moving forward. Again, Ruiz of anybody is going to be saying, I don't understand this. Carlisle talked a lot, but Claire didn't say anything. Jammed in with the other four of us in the carriage. She stayed silent the whole time. What was she thinking? Should I ask? I wondered. I was still going back and forth on the question as we arrived at the church grounds. After going through some official procedures, we were granted entry into the inner sanctum for an audience. We were escorted into a room that seemed to be the blessed child's quarters. A transparent barrier was set up in the middle of the room, just like when I had met the Pope. There were also two chairs and a window. Six guards stood at attention under the dim lights. Therese wasn't there. Maybe she had been transferred. Regardless, it looked like an examination would happen with the blessed child's fanboys standing by. They didn't seem hostile, just a little tense and unwilling to meet his eyes. Hopefully Therese isn't in trouble. I mean, it, it it doesn't really imply that the blessed child's in the room. So maybe she's going to enter with the blessed child. But I can see her being questioned right now. Hopefully she didn't get in trouble for it. Uh, but again, she got to, she got transferred the last time assassins took out her men. So maybe they're going to transfer again because they all got beat up by Rudius. I'm not looking for apologies, guys. It's your job. I get it, I thought. Besides, I beat them all unconscious. They started it, and I'd finished it. We were even... They were probably going to see some professional consequences too. So I was happy to let things go. I hope that I can leave here with us on friendly terms, actually. I didn't like the idea of these guys holding a grudge against me. Shall we begin? The blessed child and Zenith sat down opposite each other. Dust gently supported Zenith's head, positioning her so that she was still, her eyes open. Then the blessed child leaned forward and gazed deep into Zenith's eyes. It reminded me of an optometrist exam. Whoa. The blessed child's gaze shone as she gazed at Zenith. It literally shone. I can't think of a better way to put it. Faint threads of light connected them eye to eye. The Ataku were all ooing and awing over it. That's our blessed child. She really is blessed. The light didn't appear before. Was she putting on a show? Or did it take effort? Yeah, that makes me wonder if this is like a different aspect. Because again, we've, we've had times where she was apparently peering into people when she was Rudeus. I can see if she's looking at Rudeus directly. It, you, you might not see it. But if she's looking at other people and using it, you would think that he would have seen it before. So it, it sort of indicates there's a she's doing something different here. Or maybe because they're inside. He, he's seen her using it before and it was out, he was outside. So, But again, she knew all that information. When she when they were going to that meeting and, he was, and she was his hostage, she was claiming things. But this is all stuff that she already knew. So she wasn't using her ability that entire time. This is fine. Like, it kind of indicates that all these other times, she's never used her ability. This is the first time she's actually not used her ability. She's been lying to Rudia's claim that she's learning information as they go along, but she knew it all already. Just like with Carlisle. She said, oh, yeah, I didn't get a chance to see what he was doing. She already knew. That light didn't appear before. Was she put on a show or did it take effort? Maybe it was like fire magic. As your magic gets stronger, the fire gets hotter and brighter. Maybe this phenomenon only happened when she was pushing her power to the limit. She switched from her basic cable to fire optic. Claire clenched her fists over her heart like she was praying. I tried to pull myself back on task right now. All Zenith's past was being laid out bare. The blessed child might even be able to see the memories that had been devoured by her magic crystal prison in the depths of the labyrinth. If Zenith's memories revealed the cause, maybe she could shed light on the solution. Just one clue, one little clue might be enough for one of my brainier friends to think of something. Orsted or Kishidika maybe. Now you want to say that Kishidika is going to help you. Now you're calling Kishidika a brainer. Any other time you insult her. <laughs> oh, the blessed child said softly, then shivered. Dust released Zenith's head, then gently touched the blessed child's shoulder. Does that mean download complete? The blessed child stood up, her eyes wide open. She was looking straight at me. Rius Grey Rat. Yes, I replied. The use of my full name made me sit up straight. I have seen the memories of Zenith Grey Rat. What did you see? Until the displacement incident, she lived in the village of Buena in Fatoa, where she lent her services to the local healer while raising Aisha and Norn. Did they say that back then? I, th I was thinking this is like going to be a mix up for her memories, but I, I mean, I would assume that's what she did while she was working there or while she was living there, that she could have had a job there. But I don't think they ever in implied that she was working as a, as a local healer. We're going all the way back to that. Okay, no, fair enough. 
she got to go through everything in order or it sounded like she was just talking at random. Yeah, there's the thing there. She says that I have memories of Zenith Grey Rat. Until the displacement incident, she lived in Buena Village. So she's jumping back to there. So I was kind of thinking that that's kind of implying that she's she doesn't have anything post the displacement incident. Like nothing is writing. Like it's just when she starts it out, again, for Rudius, she's starting from now and she's going back slowly. And she only got far back enough to see uh, the Ponsu Shrine in the, in the basement. Here it's like, we're going to jump straight to the displacement incident. Or she's going to start from back there and go forward. But that's like in the middle. That's like dead set. That's almost dead set in the middle. After you left, not a day went by that she didn't worry about you. She worried that you weren't eating properly. That you weren't doing your laundry. That you were chasing after lots of different girls. Oh well, sorry mom. At least I didn't cheat on anyone. The Rudius continent was a peaceful land up until it was conquered by bits below the waist. I even managed to hold off invade. I really don't care about a joke right now, Rudius. <laughs> I really don't care about a joke right now. The Rudius continent was peaceful land up until it was conquered by um, by the bits below the waist. It even manages to hold off invading unsuspected land of Silphy for a while. Hard as that might be to imagine for anyone who knew Rudius, uh, troops' movements over the past few years. Continuing, in the midst of her worries about you, her memories cut to white. The displacement incident. I remember that moment. Most people, though, were displaced before they realized what was happening. Or why. That's what happened to Paul. And I heard the same thing was true for Lilia. For some time after that, only darkness. Uh, some time? Yes. It was as though she remained deep in a dreamless sleep as a great deal of time passed around her. That's a that's a good thing. I mean, there's, there's a fear there that it's like a situation like, you know, Dr. Stone where it's like being stuck in stone and you still have your consciousness is still running the entire time. I'm sorry. That would make anybody go insane. There ain't no way in hell you can stay there that long, being un unable to move, just trapped in your own thoughts. So she had no memories of that period. In that case, she must have been sent straight into the labyrinth by the displacement incident. Yeah, that's another good answer there because I think at some point with the whole situation with geese getting the information, which again, know where that came from. <laughs> it kind of, I had, a, I kind of had a thought process of her like being captured. That she was in there and she was fighting to save her own life. And then at some point she gets captured and put in the, the gym. No, directly there. The chance of that happening had to be tiny. But it wasn't impossible. A random teleportation to anywhere in the world had a small chance of burying you inside of a wall. If you did it on purpose, set up an entry and exit circle in advance and so on, that would mostly eliminate any kind of risk. The displacement incident had really blown our lives apart. It was apparently the aftershock of Denahoshi arriving in this world. But that didn't really matter. It was all over and done with now. If humanity hadn't made teleportation circles taboo and managed their use responsibly, if they'd only done that much, they would have weathered this crisis without panicking. Yeah, that is true. I'm not sure exactly if he's really implying this, but um, it seems to imply it. The idea of like, if if teleportation circles were still a thing and managed and used responsibly, this whole displacement incident would probably have been less problem. Like, everybody would have been teleported to different places and they go, oh, hey, I'm here. Oh, hey, can I use your teleport? I need to get back to Wayne Village. <laughs> yeah, sure, try over there. <laughs> It'd be like super quick fix. Except for the people that fall and drown or whatever else and put in front of monsters. I'll tell Ariel that next time. Ariel will get things worked out if I write up a report on teleportation for her. Is, is he implying that he wants to get Ariel's to make it not taboo and make it more public? They kind of imply this is kind of a global thing because of the whole soldiers and everything. It's not really simply saying, hey, Ariel, fix this for me. That's weird. Wait, how did Geese find Zenith then? He told me he went asking around and heard she was in the depths of the teleportation labyrinth. Hold on. Is he finally going to pick up on this? Is he going to finally sniff this out? Then she had a dream, the blessed child said. I refocused. He's not even here right now. You can question Geese later. A dream? I asked. A dream. She began to feel like she'd been turned into a rag doll. A rag doll? Still, it was a pleasant dream, the blessed child said, then closed her eyes. Her voice flowed on as though she was watching a film play on the inside of her eyelids. She dreamt of living an easy life in a house she didn't know. She and Lilia sat in the sun and tended to the garden. The blessed child voice was subtly changed. She sounded like Zenith. Paul was gone, but Rudy and Sylphie got married, and then they had a baby. But then, well, like father, like son, Rudy went off with Roxy, then with Edis. They just kept coming. They all seem happy, at least. Even Sylphie. 
Norm moaned a lot, but she still went to school and kissed me goodbye every morning. I shan't. This is that confirmation. She sees everything. She just can't. She can't say it. She sees it and she acknowledges it for what it is. That's the key thing there. Like, of course she sees things. She's looking around the room or whatever. She's looking at the ceiling. She's listening. She's acknowledging what's happening around her. Norm moaned a lot, but she still went to school and kissed me goodbye every morning. Aisha and I are getting to be such good friends. Did you know she likes flowers? I tell her I like apples and daffodils. And she turned to me and said, Miss Zenith? You can call me mom, I told her. But Lily looked a bit unhappy about that. I guess she wants Aisha to see her as mom too. I wonder if this is an aspect that she thinks that she's saying things, but it's not coming out. I told her I like apples and daffodils. And she turned to me and said, Miss Zenith? You can call me mom, I told her. But Lilia just looked unhappy. I think it's that she thinks that she's talking to them, but it's not. nothing's coming out. Roxy is teaching at a local school. Norn says all the kids love her. She must be pretty old, given she's a demon. But, oh well. Rudy adores her, so I guess I shouldn't worry about age too much. I got to meet Edis for the first time. It was plain as day how much she loves Rudy. She came to see me when no one else was around. Her face bright red. Then she said something like, I'm, I'm still figuring stuff out, but I'll do my very best. Honestly, I just burst out laughing. <laughs> I don't like this. This actually hurts to read. This actually really hurts to read. I told her to try to say that to Rudy instead. There was no point in being all formal around me. Then Addis went bright red again and bowed her head. It was the sweetest thing. She was always so bold, you know. Those were her memories of the past few years. They didn't quite match up with mine. Norn hardly ever spoke to Zenith. And while I should talk to her in the garden frequently, Zenith never replied. But that does that mean in Zenith's eyes? Did it feel to her like she was talking to everyone and they were replying? Oh no. Then there's Rudy's children. Then there's Rudy's children. Lucy is the most precious little thing. She's still so little, but she's doing her best to be big sister. She listens so careful to everything Sylphie says, and she practices her magic every day to show Rudy. With me though, she doesn't act so tough. She says she's not as strong as her mama. She's hard on herself. I told her that she has nothing to worry about. One day, she'll be able to do it all. And even if not, she'll find her own talent. After that, she said she'd do her best. Oh, she's so sweet. Lana really likes me. You know, she was talking from the moment she was born. She calls me over every little thing. Granny, granny, she says. The next thing I know, Leo comes over, saying, Miss Zenith, help. Miss Lotta, wet herself. Lately, she climbs up on my knees, and we sit in the sun with Leo and talk about the countryside around the house, or about their daddy's hometown, that sort of thing. Otters loves breasts, just like Rudy when he was little. Whenever I pick him up, he grabs at mine, and he looks so pleased with himself. I suppose even the breasts of an old granny like me will do. He's a little bit bad, just like Paul and Rudy. I told him if he's going to make all the girls cry like Rudy, he has to make sure they'll all be happy in the end, too. Rudy just realized that his eyes were hot. Tears were framing down his cheeks. Lucy hardly ever went near Zenith, and Lada couldn't talk. More than half of the scenes the blessed child describes were just Zenith's delusions. Hallucinations playing behind her empty eyes. But the world she saw was so kind. I don't know if I can finish this. The reason this hurts is because there's it's a what if scenario that I've played in my head a million times. I mean, there's a thought process that some of this is not so much a hallucination, but more of a um, it could be possibly missed signals that are coming from her her ability. I wonder. Oh, I almost forgot. Rudy started working for this really amazing guy, the Dragon God Orsted, he's called. A distant apprentice of one of the three Demon Slayer heroes, the Dragon God Udipin. He's supposed to be super strong, super scary. Everyone seems terrified of him, but he doesn't seem to be bad to me. I think deep down, 
He just wants to make friends. He's hung up on Rudy in particular. He keeps coming to see how our family is getting along. I talk to him sometimes, but he doesn't seem very used to talking to people. He gets all tongue-tied. He's a good person, though. He teaches Lucy tricks to help with her magic when she's struggling, though they're a bit complicated. I don't think she understands them very well. Some of this is, I'm, I'm wondering if it's just Rudy's never sees it. Once I asked if he wanted to hold Lana, he was so nervous about it, but he was very careful when he took her. He's not so keen on Leo and Otis, though, I think. The other day, he made Otis cry, then left without greeting Edis. I wonder what sort of work Rudy is doing for this man who's so strong and yet so kind. Whatever it is, I'm proud of him. I'm sure Paul would be too. How much is this true, I wondered. Orsted almost never came to the house. Is he coming by without telling me? I mean, I can see him visiting whenever Rudius is out doing a job. He said that he was going to protect Rudius's house. What if Orsted sees some sort of threat coming to his house all the time and he's constantly helping Rudy, he just doesn't know about it? The exchanges with her and Orsted might be wrong, but their delusions created, he's implying that it's hallucinations that are created upon something that actually happened. And yes, I think a lot of this, if there's no sort of blessed child, cursed child thing happening here, a lot of this could be essentially fabricated on what she wants to do, what she wants to happen. So if Norn comes by in the morning and walks by mom, maybe she looked up to mom and says, mom, I'm going to school and then goes to leave. It could be that Zenith herself is hoping for a kiss and thus her mind records, I got a kiss from her. Or said almost never comes to the house. Is he coming by without telling me? Ruiz has grown up in such a wonderful young man. Norn and Aisha are grown up now too. And Sylphie said her second baby. Lily was so worried. Saying now that she had to be on top of looking after me. How silly. Obviously, the children come first. I'm going to visit my mother. So leaving Sylphie to you, Lilia. Okay? This is exactly what I was talking about. If the ideas of it, it, it basically looking into the memories, even if it isn't reading the mind, even if you can't fix something, it is as simply as seeing a message like this. Rudy's grown up and such a wonderful young man. When you're taking care of somebody that's lost themselves so much, just to wonder if what they're thinking right now, I mean, all this stuff is that, to know that there's something in there, but to get a message like that, don't worry about me. I'll be fine. I used to be an adventurer, you know? We're going with Rudy and Aisha and Rudy's friend Cliff. Haha, <laughs> I'm getting all excited, thinking about going on a trip with Rudy. Is that his... Zenith's memories were approaching the present day. Mother has gotten so old. She's nothing like how I remembered. I thought she'd yell at me, for sure. But instead she comes up to me, saying, Zenith, oh Zenith, and look, all weepy. She's gotta be reading memories. She's gotta be reading people. I don't think anything indicated so far. She thinks that she's saying things. And yes, it's not coming out. Again, this goes back to my theory. I think there's a possibility she could have something similar to the McGurdians. I think I was bringing up this theory when she, when Lada was sitting on her lap. I think she might have an ability similar to the McGurdians. That she is sending signals to people and they just can't receive it. Lada is able to receive it. But she's thinking that she's talking to people because she's using that ability. And it's just not clicking with anybody. She's basically like Roxy. But the thing is, I think it's different in the idea that she's receiving messages from people. She's reading what people are thinking. She's reading people's minds. She's like the blessed child, but the reverse. The blessed child only sees memories and back, but she can't see what people are thinking. Whereas I think Zenith is able to read what people are thinking. And that's why she thinks that people are saying things. And she's trying to talk back, but it's not going anywhere. That's why she thinks all the kids are talking. She even says right here, Lana has always been talking since the moment she was born. She's constantly talking. Even Leo. Miss Zenith, help. Miss Lana is wet. The problem is how can they... The problem is what, what can come from that? Like how can, how can they possibly get the ability to be able to understand what she's saying back? Mother has gotten so old. She's nothing like how I remember her. I thought she'd yell at me for sure. But instead, she comes up to saying, Zenith. Oh, Zenith, and looked all weepy. She was worried I was hurt or unwell, so she brought a doctor to see me. I mean, as you can see, I'm in perfect health, but Mother does like to worry. She brought the doctor in every day. She was always so hard on us.
But now she looks at me like she might cry. She doesn't scold me at all. She comes by so often because she's worried. Oh, dad came too. He's grown out his beard. Can you believe it? He never used to wear it like that. When I asked him about it, he said he'd let it grow because he got promoted. It looks so awful on him. I have to laugh. Again, that, it does kind of push against the idea of her sp speaking through the mind and him replying. But it could be that she's she thinks that she's speaking at them, but then she finds something in his memories that talks about it. Again, it could just be a delusion. Rhea shot a glance at Claire and Carlisle. Claire had her face buried in his chest while Carlisle stroked her hair. His eyes were brimming with tears. The only thing is, Mother doesn't get on with Rudy at all. Rudy hates people looking down on him and telling him what to do. He and Mother got in a fight. I wish they'd find a way to make up. Then Rudy went and backed Mother right into a corner. Paul was always like that when we fought back in Buena. Rudy really doesn't pull his punches. Well, I'll just have to get them to make up. The bus child's eyes opened. Is that the end then? Phew, she said, rubbing her eyes and exhaling. Before she collapsed back into her chair, the Otakus rushed to her side. One had what looked like a hot towel, another with a glass of water. One started massaging her shoulders. It was like she was some ancient empress or something. My apologies. That's all I saw. Did you hear what you wanted? The blessed child asked. She sounded wiped out. Using the power really drains her. Huh, I thought. Yes. <laughs> that would be my reply is yes. That was everything. I guess it would. She read through all of Zenith's memories, downloaded them into her brain. Then her brain converted the whole thing into a little simulated Zenith monologue for us. Having all that information rush into your brain at once must be an exhausting. For once, I thought, maybe I should join the otaku. She deserved that shoulder rub. Yes, thank you, I replied. I still wanted to know how to fix Zenith, but now I knew how she felt after becoming like this. Just knowing that made coming to Millis worth it. Knowing that she's in there, no matter how delusional it might seem, that's insane. It's almost like also knowing that it's not a, it's not that she's in pain, that she's not not fully lost, that she's not an empty husk. It may not seem like much, but she is happy now, the blessed child said. She knows that Paul is dead, and she understands what is happening around her. She sure does, I thought. She understands a lot more than I ever imagined. It all still felt a bit dreamlike, and the blessed child's voice had lent a fairy tale quality. But I mean, she knew how many kids I had, and her description of their personalities had been pretty solid. Except for Lada, maybe. Lada did like Zenith, though. Maybe from Zenith's point of view, it looked like she was trying to communicate. There was one more thing I learned, the blessed child said. I looked at her questioningly. Zenith, I don't know how much she sees, but she can read minds. Yep. Read minds? Because of her condition, she doesn't always interpret what she reads correctly. And I think that she's filling in parts that she can't read with her own stories. The blessed child's voice trailed off. She beckoned to me, gesturing me to bring my ear to her mouth. The Takus all immediately covered their ears and turned away. <laughs> That's interesting. They probably, they probably do this on a regular basis. I leaned towards her. She whispered. She's a blessed child. That was the assumption. I nodded slowly. I'd known from the start that it was likely that she was cursed. And I knew all too well that cursed child and blessed child were, in essence, one and the same. If this gets out, things will get out of hand again. I recommend you keep it safe. Yeah, and that was like my thought process. That was one of my theories that I had was why Claire was doing all this. Is that she had learned about um, Elisa's case after learning what happened with Rudius. And that's technically what happened. And that was kind of what my theory was, that at some point Claire was going to be going around and trying to figure out if there was anything similar to Ellen Lace, and they were going to discover, oh, if this happened to Zenith, then she's going to be like Ellen Lace or others that possibly were caught in gems, and it might be in some tome somewhere, common knowledge of what happened to Ellen Lace, and the same will be for Zenith. And so my theory was that she was trying to get her married off to a royalty or something like that to secure her into the Latria family, and Rudius won't be able to take her away. No question about it, I agreed. I am a follower of Orsted. I'll protect her no matter what. Total commitment. That's who you are, isn't it? I probably didn't need to tell her. I go all out, given that I did try to kidnap her. But yeah, those are the words I'm trying to live by. I knew two things now. The first was that Zenith had power. She could read minds. It wasn't clear how much she could read, but it probably wasn't killing her. Yeah, that was it. that was a big question mark for her compared to with Elise. Is that fear that she possibly might have something similar where if she doesn't feed it, it'll harm her. And that could be the case. If she doesn't keep reading minds and pulling in data from people, it might harm her. Like reading minds is like that, you know, taking something in to collate it. Like at some point she's going to start passing gems. Maybe she has like a situation like it's like, I don't know, kidney stones or something. She has to pass them every now and then. 
It was more like she didn't know how to communicate what she saw. No immediate danger. I could relax a bit knowing that. The second was that something was up with Geese. Some of what he'd told me didn't fit. And honestly, his behavior throughout this whole incident was a bit off. Going to the Latria estate, even though they favored demon expulsion, then blindly following Claire's orders to bring Zenith out in the open, I need to talk to him soon, today, if possible. Finally picking up on all the stuff that I've been suspecting with that. Blessed child, I'm really glad we met. I'd like to thank you somehow. I didn't know how to get Zenith's memories back, or rather, how to get her back to her old self, but I learned that things were nowhere near as bad as I'd feared. She was conscious, just dreaming. That meant that one day, she might wake up, and even if she didn't, so long as she was happy like this, maybe that was okay. Yeah, it's always the aspect of it is just keeping them comfortable, keep them happy. You are very kind. In that case, I have two requests. May I make them? Go ahead. Will you give me that bracelet? Bracelet? I looked down and saw Orsted's bracelet shining on my arm. Yes, said the blessed child. I don't like where this is going. <laughs> I don't like where this is going. Um, see, the thing is, I can't take it off. Isn't there something else? Anything will do, so long as it identifies the bearer as a follower of Orsted at a glance. So long as it identifies the bearer of the follower of Orsted at a glance, does that mean what I think she means? You want to join Orsted? I do. I prefer to live past 30. Fair enough. I guess, yeah, she probably did see Rudius talking to Orsted on the tablets, so that makes sense why she knows that. I was about to say that proves that she talked to Orsted, or she'd seen Orsted's eyes. And I was like, she's going to steal that bracelet and he's going to write in the man god. <laughs> okay, he didn't let her have it. He's not dumb. Yeah, I did think about that, though. Um, technically, with the idea of him being disarmed, technically that would have meant that he would have been at least seen by the man god again. That's right, her destiny is weak. She's fated to die unless something changes. She wasn't in the best shape, but she didn't seem especially sickly either. That left assassinations as the biggest worry. Considering her power and sheer number of schemes going on in the Mills Church, that was the likeliest cause. If she was under Orsa's protection, though, the Cardinal, who had a guilty conscience about the whole thing, and the Pope, who thought I was on his side now, would find it a lot harder to move against her. Still, it wasn't a guarantee. That is very true. I'm not sure exactly how much they would fear that. Unless maybe Orsa... I think if Orsa were to make an appearance, give her the bracelet... That would be stronger. But I guess it, it is kind of in proxy. If they're already fearing, if they're already showing a status of Rudius right now in front of that room of having a fear of him because of Dragon God Orsted, it might help. What about the second thing? I want you to get Therese off on a lighter sentence. Unless we do something, she's going to be demoted and sent off far away. There's that proof, there's that confirmation there. I mean, doesn't she kind of have it coming? I pointed out. Not only was she just following orders, but she couldn't even carry out those orders. That's not fair. But you must understand, Rudius, her loss to you was a rather humiliating defeat for the Cardinal. If she's sent away, she will be killed, and I want her in my guard. I could see how the Cardinal might kill her out of pure spite when she wasn't useful anymore. But she stuck to her role as his henchman, and this is what happens to henchmen who fail. This is one of those moments like, Rudy, have you learned nothing over the last 24 hours? <laughs> like, he just let Claire go after everything that happened there, and Therese was even more so trying to help you out. And this is the camel's back right here? Rudius has learned nothing. He has literally learned nothing over that whole meeting. Still, I couldn't deny that she'd done absolutely everything she could for Zenith. Death was a tall price to pay for following orders and being manipulated. All right, I said. Thanks, blessed child, for setting him straight there. Thank you. May I have your signature? One of the fanboys brought over a document to me. They were on top of everything, those guys. I do look forward to working with you in the future, Sir Rudius, she said. And that was a story about how the blessed child became a follower of Horsted. <laughs> oh, I didn't think I was going to get through all that. Ugh. Painful. Rudius, we were waiting for a coach in a side room when Clara dressed me. Her face was stony as ever. That was just how she looked. Unless that was anxiety I was reading in her face. This is far from an appropriate place to discuss what I have to say, she continued. And I'd hoped to talk to you when things were calmed down somewhat. But you're sure to grow more busy as time wears on. May we speak now? I nodded. Is she mad at me for having three wives? Two was bad enough, but three? The Mills Church will never stand for such a thing. I don't think so, because she's already, in her little chapter right there, it already mentioned the idea that she was fine with, um, she understood that she couldn't push her religion on, uh, it was Paul. So, regard to the mess I caused. Okay, 
Huh. So it was not about the wife thing. She wants to talk about herself. Fair enough. She wasn't about to come chew me out for life choices after what she tried to pull. That would be ridiculous. Duh. Her expression remained firm, and she went on. I know what I tried to do was unforgivable. Yep, I said. It might have been for Zena's sake or whatever, but her treatment plan was way overboard. If she'd gone through with it, well, let's just say that we wouldn't be chatting as amicably as this. I want you to punish me, Claire said. But punish? Yes, I stole Zena from you, and I tried to do something utterly inhuman to her. I should be punished accordingly. Can't you just apologize? What would that solve? Sins must be punished, she insisted. I saw where she was coming from. If sorry made everything better, there'd be no need for police. Pretty much everyone who contributed to the mess had received some sort of punishment, but not Claire. And Claire herself wasn't satisfied with that. Okay, then. What kind of punishment do you think you deserve? You could beat me up with a whip or a staff or cut my arms off. You could even kill me. I don't care. <laughs> that was a bit much. I didn't want to become known as Grandma Killer. Plus, Zenith would be so mad at me. <laughs> You heard what Zenith said in there. You saw how self-righteous I was. How little thought I gave to anyone else. You saw how she trusted me. Like a baby. And I was going to throw her into hell. Fools like me don't need to be pitied. Only be crushed by hammer of justice. Her hands were clenched into a fist and shaking. So that's what she heard back there. It sounded a little different to me. Zenith forgave Claire. I don't think she knew what Claire planned. But she knew Claire was suffering over some decision. And she knew it related to her. That's why, when she saw Claire trying to take all the blame herself back at the trial without anyone standing up for her, Zenith had forgiven her. Then she slapped Carlisle and me, but not Claire. Okay, maybe I'm twisting up the logic a bit far. Yeah, that's a, that's a stretch there. But again, what possibly Zenith seen in that room was Claire saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I want to help you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then Carlisle's over here going, everything's ruined. We were going to do something. We we're going to do something. Darn it. And then Reese is over here going, I can it. I jig it. Yeah, take that. No wonder she's going to stand up and go, what the hell are you guys doing? Maybe it was right that Claire received some kind of punishment. Claire herself seemed to want punishment more than forgiveness anyways. And she wasn't going anywhere until she got it. Fine then. Well, okay, if you insist. I said. Claire looked at me nervously. Sorry, but if it's all the same to you, I'm going to use my only advantage. I want you to convert. You mean to your religion? You want me to worship demons? Crap. That wasn't the right word. Not convert. I really don't want you to join the Roxy cult. I'm about to say, what the hell? Convert from Millis to Roxy. That would be some weird twist. Okay, sure. I guess I'm going to do that now. How the heck do I explain this? Oh, well, I guess I can spell it out for her. I think it's going to probably be to uh, try to possibly use her. Convert to Orsted? Maybe follow Orsted? He can, yeah, recruit her to the mercenary band and under Orsted. No, sorry. It's not what I meant. You don't have to leave the Millis Church. I mean, I want you to leave the demon expulsionist. Damn. That would, yeah, that would remove Therese from being able to work for possibly the, the blessed child. He's just getting her back to the blessed child. Now he's going to have Therese switch sides, basically. The Cardinalist is not going to let her keep continuing to guard the blessed child. I mean, that was the thing that I was hoping that would happen in that room is possibly get the blessed child moved over to the Pope. That would have been another big thing to, to demand there. I doubt they would want to do it, but he had a lot of power there. The whole Latria family? Just you would be fine with me. One of my wives is a demon, so I'd rather you didn't call her filthy. Also, I'd like you to recognize my religion and keep your opinions about my family to yourself. Claire didn't reply. I mean, this is all a decent demand right here. It's really just kind of respect me and my family. That's really what all this says. And one more thing. If you ever end up facing that sort of decision again, talk to me about it, okay? I have the power to solve most things. At least, I like to think so. Claire stared at me, shocked, but she nodded. Very well, she said. That's good. I mean, I'm not expecting them to hug and kiss and make up and all that kind of stuff, but this is a good, this is a good start. This is really just respect me and talk to me. Because that was really the, everything that was wrong with this whole situation is just not talking. She didn't look convinced. She probably wasn't sure that she'd actually been punished. Neither was I. I basically listed off everything I wanted from her, and she interpreted it as a punishment. She nodded. Even so, I guess she decided that if this is my judgment, she'd go along with it. From this day forth, I, Claire Latria shall be a demon integrationist and do everything in my power to assist the cause. I will trust in you, Rudius, and make no comment on your religion or your educational methods, nor shall I permit such words from any other. I mean, if she was willing to accept death, I guess she would be willing to accept this. Again, because she was about to make a massive mistake, and I think she probably is very happy, or very thankful to Rudius for showing her that she was going to do something really horrible and basically stopped her. And in effect as well, corrected a massive mistake that she made. At the same time, also facilitated her being able to at least hear that her daughter is there. Thank you, I replied. Just don't overdo it, okay? Pushing your thoughts on others never goes well. I understand. 
if I can get the old bird to be a bit more flexible, then I could rest a whole lot easier. That way, I could know for sure that she wasn't going to start fights with any of my wives or daughters. She was all obedient now. But what's the saying? Vows made in storms are forgotten in calm. When we met again, or rather, if we met again, I really didn't want to get into another argument. That's a flag. If we meet again. <laughs> if we meet again. That's a flag. That's all I have to say, I said. Thank you for your kindness, she replied curtly, then nodded. Could you be any worse at apologizing? <laughs> Thank you for your kindness. <laughs> Could you be any worse at apologizing, I thought, honestly. Right, so back to Cliff's place. I would probably have to show my face to Latria State later. But first, I would deal with Geese. I had serious questions about this trip and the last time we ran into him. When I thought back, I realized the guy had a real knack for showing up at the right moment. I was fascinated. He was going to explain that trick to me. I'm heading out to find geese, I said to Aisha and Zenith as I went to leave. And are we actually going to get to that in this whole chapter? This is a bit too much. Like, I'm so freaking, <laughs> I'm so exhausted right now. I was actually thinking of stopping it and just splitting them up. Big brother, hold up, Aisha called out, rushing up to stop me with her hands outstretched. Look at this. In her hands was a letter. It was sealed with wax, and on the outside was written Rudius. Wendy said that as soon as you left, Geese came by and left this, Aisha explained. I took it without a word. A letter, right in this moment. Oh, here we go. Oh, I had a bad feeling about this. I broke the seal and began to read. Rudius, hey boss, if you come back to the house from talking to the blessed child and you're reading this letter, well, you probably worked out what happened. You have? Yeah. Worked it out? I mean, there's no way you haven't, right? If you haven't, I really messed up by writing this, but what the hell? <laughs> I reckon you got some questions, right, boss? Like how I knew where Zenith was when there was no way I should. How come I took Zenith outside just the right time? This is going back a bit, but the time we first met was like that too. Quite the coincidence. Me just running into you like that in Dolia Village. Well, how'd I do it? There's some stuff that even mighty S rank adventurer geese just shouldn't be able to do. How about I tell you? It was all thanks to the man god's instructions. There it is. <laughs> Everything I did was just following the man god's advice. Basically, I'm what you call a disciple of the man god. I was pulling one over on you, boss. Well, surprised? Are you thinking I knew it? Or are you pissed yeah. off? Yeah, you're probably pissed. Yeah. Ah, well, that's only fair. Just so you know, though, I've been hearing the God's voice since I was a kid. That voice got me through some tough scrapes and a few near-death situations to boot. I'm weak. I can't get by on my own. That voice was my savior, you know. Wasn't that the same for you, boss? The man God helped you out when you came back from the demon continent. He brought you together with Old Rajard. They made sure you got your hands on that demon eye. He got you. I mean, he's telling him everything. I, don't, I, I, I guess he could have told him. He got you out of cell and saved your little sister's life. It was the man god who told me where to find Zenith too. All of that. He did it for you, boss. You're a traitor. What, did you have a little falling out? I know the man god isn't benevolent. All the advice he gives is so he can use us for his own ends. We're like toys to him, honestly. I guess you think you're too important for that. Really got in your skin, huh? But betraying him? Smashing everything up? Don't you think you went a little too far? Okay, so he used you. But we owe him everything. That's the only way this all makes sense. Yeah, see, the problem with all this stuff is I think from Geese's perspective, he thinks that he gets benefits. Yes, it's for his game, but it's for benefits. But the problem is that Geese doesn't have a family that the man god's trying to kill. <laughs> like, yeah, Geese, I follow everything you're saying here that, yes, he's helped me out. He got me this, got me that, got me this, got me this. But that was all towards a thing that he was, in the end, trying to kill him. In the end, he was trying to kill him, keep him away from people that he would eventually have children with and then eventually come after him. That's the connect disconnection there. Yeah, but yeah, I was, I was gonna mention it earlier, but yeah, that was one of the only ones that I wasn't really 100% sure is did he go to Doldia Village by the call of the man god? Because there was like a, there's a gap there in all that conversation. He said that, you know, sort of implied yet yeah, the whole thing with his home village. And then he said something about the labyrinth thing, but never implied anything in that area. But yeah, it kind of made sense that he went there and he knew where to find that Paul was going to be there and everything. Okay, so he used you, but we owe him everything. That's the only way this all makes sense. That's how I saw it after my hometown got wiped off the map. Wiped off the map. That's more detrimental than what he sort of implied before. The man God manipulated me. Then he wiped out my home and he laughed about it. 
he had the same thing happen to him as Rudius. And he just keeps going with it? Tell me all about how he played me. Of course, I was yeah. off. Like, what the yeah. f dude? What is wrong with you? Get screwed. I don't have it, you know? But this is what he told me. After everything I'd done for you, this is nothing. I reckon he meant to yeah. me off more, send me over the edge, you know, drive me crazy, just so he could laugh at me. But when he said that, it hit me. Wham, he's right, I thought. Thinking about what I owed him, after all the times he saved my yeah. I figured I could just let it go. I mean, there's a little grudge underneath it all, but that's normal, ain't it? No. <laughs> there's a screw loose here. There's a massive screw loose here. It's almost like he's trying to connect to Rudius in this whole thing, too. It's like, you know, yeah, he gave you this, gave you this, gave you this, and what's this whole one thing here? Whatever. I mean, your family? Pfft. You can get another Roxy. You can get another selfie. You can get another edit. Don't worry about your... You know, just, just don't have wives. Yeah. Yeah, just don't have wives. You're good, right? I mean, you, your, your destiny is strong enough. You don't have to worry about him being able to take you out. He just wants to make sure you don't breed. So just, just chill with him. He gonna give you some more stuff. Be like me. So what if I lost my family? He's done a lot of other cool things for me, and I can't... The thing is, Geese's mindset, too, is that I can't do things without him. I don't have power. I don't have strength. I don't have allies. I'm not like Rudius where I can just build something. I need somebody's help. And the man guy keeps helping me. Easily manipulated. Anyways, I reckon you don't get it. Huh, um, boss? You probably reading this like, newbie? You were out of your mind. And it, maybe it feels wrong to you. But not to me. As far as I see it, you're turning your back on your debts. Buying the hand that fed you. So sorry, boss. But I think I'm on team man god now. No, I think what Geese doesn't see is that this was all to ruin Rudius. He did nothing for Rudius to help Rudius. He was trying to get Rudius killed. He wasn't trying to be beneficial to Rudius. And that might be the same case for Geese, and he just doesn't realize it. This time, I was testing the waters, seeing what you were capable of. I got you right in my trap, then set the Temple Knights against you. Looks like you blasted straight through them in the end. But hey, now I know what doesn't work. You messed up. You showed me every trick you got. I'm off to get enough allies so I know I can beat you. Then I'll be back to fight you. Head on. Fair and square. It's war, boss. Plan your funeral. Yeah, he's going to kill him. Yeah, that was, that was one of my question marks of this whole situation was, did the man god talk to him before or after this chapter? This is before. Straight up. He's joined him. He's going to build an army. It's going to come after him. Now, granted, the way that it seemed like it was word, it was more of an idea of, like, fighting against what Orsted and Rudius are doing as a team wasn't so much he wanted to kill Rudius. I'm going to kill you, Rudius. Here he's saying it. I'm going to kill you, Rudius. But there's almost a side of me. There's almost a side of me that because Geese knows how manipulative the man-god is and how dangerous, he might possibly know how dangerous the man-god is. And right now, he's writing this, even knowing that the man-god sees it, acting like he's dead set on killing Rudius. Because he wants Rudius, this letter right here is probably something the man-god wouldn't want. Because what does this letter do? This letter is Geese telling, and, and again, it, it could be Geese is a complete psychopath right now, and he's just totally fed in to trust the man-god, and he's lost everything, and he has nothing, so the man god giving him things is a benefit. But Geese is not stupid, and it almost feels like Geese is writing this letter to tell Rudius, I can't stop Rudius get strong. Rudius, here is my warning. He didn't have to leave this letter. He could have attacked Rudius without Rudius knowing. He could have blindsided him with a massive group of people. He's telling Rudius, I'm going to come with people. Get ready. Get strong. I have to fight you. I have nothing, Rudius, and I know the man god's dangerous. I have to fight you, so please get strong. Please get powerful. It could be a warning to him because he wants Rudius to win against him. I don't hate you or nothing. We had a good time back in prison, and I'll never forget our journey on the Holy Sword Highway. The Labyrinth Hunt, too. That was the most alive I'd felt in ages. I hadn't forgotten any of that, but that is as far as it goes. I don't hate you, but I don't owe you nothing. I might have my little problems with the man god, but I owe him. Even when there's hard feelings, you gotta pay what you owe. That's a jinx for both of us, boss. Here's a second owing. This is the second owing. Just like Rada. Rada was the same way. She had a debt to pay. 
and she finally got the opportunity to pay that debt. What's with debts? A lot of debts. Yours. Geese Nucadia? Nucadia? I don't know if they've mentioned Nucadia before. I sprinted out of the house. Geese, I yelled as I ran. Geese. Geese was my enemy. I didn't know how, but he'd seen the magic armor. He said he was getting ready to face me. How? Next time, he'd fight me fair and square. Could I trust that? It didn't matter. If that's what he meant to do, I would stop him. I had to kill him. I kept running all the way to the merchant district until I burst into the mercenary office. I immediately sent a message to Orson about everything that happened in Millis, the identity of the man God's disciple, and the contents of the letter. I wasn't going to wait for an answer. I was going after Geese. One problem. I had no way of knowing where he'd gone. Working alone would be foolishly inefficient. I went back to the church and had them put out a warrant for Geese's arrest. And then I went to the Temple Knights and demanded they sent out search parties throughout Milshin and the surrounding area. But Geese was a disciple of the man god. He could see the future. Geese, the guy who got S rank with zero combat abilities. There was no way in hell I was catching him. And that was chapter seven. <laughs> I was so afraid I was going to finish this chapter. My gosh, I'm so exhausted. I, I almost wish that I did five and six and then seven separately, but it is what it is. You guys get an extra long chapter and I'm going to, at least I got a good two weeks to edit this um, because it's going to be probably a rough one to edit because I, it's always like an aspect of like, if I do pre-reads, it's like I cry during the pre-read and then I cry during the Mashuko Monday recording and then I cry during watching Mashuko Monday. But this was, this was, like I said, this was different because this chapter hurts so much. I mean, just like I said earlier, is that these are the what ifs that, somebody who has somebody that is kind of losing their mind and losing themselves question all the time. Are they there? What do they see? Are they responding? Is it just that they can't say something? But it was interesting to see that, yes, my my theory around Zenith being possibly able to communicate just like the McGurdians seems to be there. The problem, again, is just that the reception. And I, and I wonder, I really do wonder at this point if Lada is the one that can possibly receive it. That would be very interesting because again, I was kind of curious if that was the case with Roxy, that she just has that disconnection there, that she just can't receive stuff because she's always set up whenever she's trying to do that stuff. It's always like a, a crackle or whatever. Um, so I'm curious if this will be a, a situation where she can communicate like that, it's that she can't send it because nobody's there to receive it. I would almost say if I was Rudius, I would probably take Zenith to the Megurdian village. I would totally take her to the Megurdian village and see if she can possibly communicate to them. Not that I'd want to leave her there, but it would at least answer a question there. Give her people to communicate with. But yeah, very, very, very emotional set of chapters. You all suck for making me have to live read it. <laughs> it's a very difficult thing to do live reads. Like I said before, it's like, I don't know who's talking, so I don't, I don't really, can't, I can't do the voices, but at the same time, it's, it's good either way. I think there is an, there is a fun aspect of some of these chapters to do kind of a, a live react to it and give you guys my my honest first feelings on a lot of stuff and and hopefully not miss too much stuff going through it because there's almost an aspect of wanting to read it and you're not able to sit there and kind of analyze what it's saying again there's pros and cons to it but yes the geese thing this this is not too much of a shock this is just confirming um i, I think this has been so telegraphed and again i think that chapter being there where it was i think it kind of spoils things i wish that was I almost wish that that chapter wasn't there because I think this would be much more of a shock coming into this. This would have been way more of a shock if I didn't have that chapter to, to go off of. But again, my, my big question mark here is, is this showing that Geese is out of his mind? He has no desire to protect people, which was a, a question mark I had was like, what does he think about family? What does he think about Rudius? What does he think about Zenith? Does he really care about Zenith? Um, is he a, a selfish person? I've never gotten an indication of what he, if he cares about other people. This is a solidification of everything that I was kind of questioning during these chapters right here of him manipulating the situation, obviously, and possibly putting Zenith in harm's way and not really truly caring about her. But it also answers the question of how kind of selfish he is because he's working for the man god, despite what the man god's done against him. But again, I really do feel like this might be him warning Rudius. I don't think the man god would want him to warn Rudius, I'm coming at you, bro. Hey, let's have a fair fight, bro. No, if he was doing what the man god want him to do, he would just kill Rudius with a pack of people without warning him. He wants Rudius to win, I think. Or at least he wants Rudius not to get caught off guard and to be too one-sided and then him feel bad about it. So the, either way, it implies that he does at least care for Rudius in some way. In some way, he wants Rudius to not get caught off guard. It's interesting. But it is interesting how much he's pushing the traitor aspect. 
I think he said it twice, right? He called him a traitor. You betrayed the man god, dude. He helps us out all the time, dude. Yeah, he messes you up every night. Yeah, he's gonna, he gonna, he gonna, he's gonna, it's a give and take, bro. Sometimes he's gonna take some stuff. You betrayed him, dude. I would never do that. Anyway, some stuff to stew on. I might, I might talk a little bit more about it um, in the next Mishika Monday. I need to do some rest, but I hope you guys enjoy this Mishika Monday as always. Thank you guys for dropping by for the premiere. Hey, chat. Hope you guys are doing well. Hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Make sure to hit the like button before you leave. My gosh, we had like a whole bunch of viewers. Um, this at this point would be like two Mishika Mondays ago. <laughs> a whole bunch of viewers and nobody's hitting the like button. You guys hate me, Babaka. Um, yeah, hit the like button before you leave. Again, as per usual, greatly appreciate you guys' support, your kind words, all that stuff. It means a great deal to me. And yes, greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate you guys' support channel monetarily through Patreon, tips, links, super thanks, memberships, all that good stuff. And until next, Mashuko Monday, where's my book? Y'all take care. Well, let's just jump into it. Chapter six, for the good of my daughter, my family. And my family... I guess it was why Zenith slapped me and Clarice. Everyone is just screwed. Everyone is just screwed up. Screwing. Everyone is just screwing up everything. Up. Everything's just screwing up everything. Everyone is just screwing up everything one day. Everyone is just screwing up everyone.